Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Eve Fedorenko, and I'll be chairing the session. I hope your guys' uh, hangovers are all subsided by now from yesterday, and you'll enjoy this session. We have um, six presentations, and the first one is by John Gautier and Roger Levy, and the title is The Neural Dynamics of Auditory Word Recognition and Integration. Welcome, John. All right. Hi, everyone. Today I'm here to tell you a bit about speech comprehension. Uh, speech comprehension is a highly predictive process. And what I mean, mean by that in a bit more detail is as you hear me speak this sentence, you're forming expectations given the context, the linguistic context, uh, and combining those together with some sensory input in order to form a linguistic percept. And I'll split coarsely that, that process of perception into two parts for today. The process of recognition by which a, a listener, like you, infers the word that I'm trying to say right now. And integration, uh, in which you update a broader representation of an utterance meaning given a recognized word. We know a lot about this process of context-driven uh, expectations and, and how, they, how they drive uh, comprehension. Uh, and one manifestation in particular of that is, is in the neural signal known as the N400. Um, so this, the N400 is a neural signal that manifests in scalp EEG, and it's a negative voltage modulation time-locked to words uh, whose amplitude is indexed by the surprisal of a word. So here I'm showing you what surprisal is. It's the negative log probability of a word in context. And I'll show you an estimate of the naturalistic N400 that we can back out of um, uh, naturalistic listening data. Um, I'll get more into the details of the data set later on. But here's the structure of the analysis that we'll be using for the whole talk. Um, this chart is going to plot how scalp voltage is modulated according to the surprisal of a word relative to the onset of that word here at t equals zero. And the vertical axis is a, a modulation uh, measure. So here, more negative values will indicate that more surprising words elicit more negative deflections of the scalp voltage. So I'll show you now finally what the N400 looks like. I estimated on naturalistic data, it looks like this. This is at a particular central parietal sensor on, on the scalp. It's estimated across 19 subjects. And we see this broad negative deflection centered around, uh, peaking around 400 milliseconds post word onset. There are many interpretations of the N400, but one that's popular and driving this project is that th this amplitude difference, so uh, exaggerated negative, negative deflections for surprising words, that, that uh, deflection re reflects the difficulty of integrating a recognized word with representations of the, of the context more broadly. Um, that picture of the N400 is a little puzzling to me because it assigns primacy to this process of integration. Uh, two things that are, are, are missing from, from this picture um, are ways in which word recognition dynamics, that's the antecedent perceptual process, could influence integration. So in particular, we're assuming here that the onset of the N400 is, is totally insensitive to the dynamics of recognition, that actually the, the neural signal here is onset at word onset. The second assumption we have is that the computation is totally the same at the, level, at the stage of integration, regardless of the, st the state of the antecedent perceptual process. Um, concretely, what, what that means is that we, we, we assume a unitary shape of modulation across all words, regardless of how, how they're treated, again, antecedent in this perceptual process of recognition. So we're going to challenge those two ideas in this project by building first an explicit model of the recognition process. And it'll look like this. We'll get into the details a lot in a moment. But at a high level, what we're going to do is build a computational cognitive model that, that specifies for every single word in a, in a speech stimulus when a listener is likely to recognize that word in stimulus time. And we'll use those predictions about the temporal dynamics of recognition to build augmented models, augmented statistical models of the neural correlates of integration. We're going to ask in more detail then um, uh, how this neural signal might be affected in various ways by recognition dynamics. Okay, so first of all, on to, oh, I'll say first about the, the data set we're using here. I'm using EEG data, data that's very generously uh, published and pre-processed by Misha Heilbronn and other collaborators. And what we have here are 19 adult subjects who listen to about an hour of audio. They're listening to, to a, a reading of Ernest Hemingway's Old Man and the Sea. And we're going to retain from, from that data set uh, eight bilateral sensors on, this, on the scalp at frontal, central, and parietal locations like this. 
And the job of our model is going to be to predict the actual full multivariate EEG time series. So how do we do that? I'm going to get into the details now of this cognitive model, and then later on get back to how we're actually explaining data. Uh, so first, the cognitive model. We're calling this a noisy channel word recognition model. And we're, we're saying that a listener's job during word recognition is to induce a distribution over possible words the speaker might be trying to say as a function of two, two, two uh, elements. The first being some linguistic context that drives expectations. So here, the sale was could be completed by words like patched, or fast, or a, uh, or fur. And secondly, as, as a factor of input, this is some incremental sensory input that the listener uses to modulate those expectation-driven uh, predictions. Um, so over here on the right, mathematically, I'll give you just a very high-level factorization of this posterior belief of a listener into two parts. Um, uh, into a prior and a likelihood. So the prior is going to ask, how likely am I as a listener to hear any given word, say like fast or a, uh, in this linguistic context? And the second term asks, how likely is a particular word to be realized as possibly noisy acoustic input to me? So the listener might ask, if I do expect to hear the word fast, how likely am I to hear the actual observed input patch? Um, this is a model so far of a listener's belief over what word is being spoken, and we turned it into a model of recognition by defining an event. We're going to call it word recognition. And it's just that time in the stimulus at which this listener's posterior belief in the ground truth word exceeds some threshold T. I have no a priori way, way to set T. We don't know what that, what, what that means. We're going to actually fit this to, to data later on. So it's a free parameter for now with the cognitive model, and I'll get back to how we actually fit that in order to explain neural data. Um, for now, just trust me that we can fit that, and I want to show you wh what the, these cognitive dynamics look like once you have a, a fit T. We can get, in terms of, stim oh, sorry, I didn't mention that T is going to be on this graph, some vertical line along this degree of belief axis. So once the ground truth word's probability exceeds that, uh, that line, then we see the word is recognized. Okay, so um, just a fun animation showing the dynamics of this model now in stimulus time. We can consider this particular word in the data set, uh, in the context, he looked at it in, dot, dot, dot. And that context licenses many possible completions, those including disgust, dismay, disgusted, discomfort, and despair. And it just, just so happens that many of those words are actually, all of those words are in the same phonological neighborhood. And we can watch in stimulus time, as we get more phones, how a listener, our listener model's beliefs update uh, in favor of the ground truth word disgust. This is actually a case of a, of a relatively late recognized word in our data which requires five phones uh, of input before the model re reaches confidence about what word is actually being spoken. So this shows you a little bit, just a quick, quick view of how our model negotiates this interaction between context-driven expectations and what the input actually gets you um, in terms of recognition. Okay, so very high level picture there that this model is going to be outputting then beliefs over what word is being intended by a speaker and furthermore, a predicted recognition time for each word. And now we're going to consider uh, more advanced models of, of the neural correlative integration, which can incorporate facts um, uh, from, the, uh, from the predictions of this model. And they're all variants in what I'm now calling the baseline model that you saw before, and that made these two assumptions about a unitary modulation for all words, just a, a shift in amplitude based on a word's surprisal and context. And it also made this assumption about um, the fact that that neural correlate is aligned to the word onset. Um, due to time, I'll just show you one, one of the two variants, the one that actually worked. And that variant relaxed that first assumption. Instead of saying that there's a unitary modulation um, of the neural signal by word surprisal, we're going to allow that the integration response's morphology actually differs based on the way that that word is recognized. So we do that by actually rolling out the cognitive model and asking which words are recognized early versus late. And we can then estimate independent neural responses for words recognized, say, early or late. This is just a toy diagram showing you what the model could capture for three words, W1, 2, and 3, where W1 and 2 are recognized relatively early in our data set. We can estimate a totally different response, um, uh, uh, totally different modulation by surprisal in the neural signal. Um, and I won't talk about the next model, which, which, didn't, which didn't work out. Um, we jointly infer uh, the two parts of, of this framework, right? So we have a cognitive model with at least one parameter here, this threshold together with many parameters in our neural models describing the, the neural realization, um, uh, the neural correlates of integration, and maybe how, how they integrate facts about recognition. We're going to, to jointly optimize those two, those two parts of the models. We have the cognitive parameter 
and these uh, temporal receptive field parameters in order to minimize prediction error on some training data set. So then we'll jump over to some test data and run a model comparison. We're going to ask, do we exceed the baseline performance, which asserted that model asserts no relationship between recognition and integration? And the answer is yes, we do for one of the models. That's the, the model that I, that I showed you. So the rest of the talk will, will involve diving into the intrinsics and the predictions of that model in order to see what we can learn about the, the, these two processes. So cognitively first, recall that we have, for any given word, a prediction about recognition time. And we can look at a, a full distribution over the whole data set of when words are recognized. And this is what our model predicts. We have, relative to word onset, uh, two thirds of words that are recognized prior to 100 milliseconds post word onset. So what we're calling, calling late recognized words are words that take more than 100 milliseconds of stimulus data in order to be recognized. That distinction is made in, in order to um, uh, locate some downstream, some corollary distinction in the neural data. So let's go look at the neural parameters of the model and ask what we discover. Um, so now we have the same plot as before, but now three different estimates of the neural modulation by surprisal for these three types of words. And what we find is a significantly amplified negative response, uh, negative modulation by surprisal for late recognized words. This ind indicates a distinct cognitive treatment of words that are recognized late. Now how about temporally? We can chart for early and late recognized words. There's a very different temporal dynamics of recognition. Is there a difference in the time to peak of the integration response? So you can take the difference between the, the latency to peak here and the latency to peak here and ask if they're different significantly. And the answer is no. There's no significant difference between uh, the time to peak, despite the, the, the vast difference in recognition dynamics. And so that shows that integration is actually quite uh, independent from the dynamics of recognition here. Um, maybe given time, I'm going to skip the, 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 the high-level cognitive gloss and just say um, our answers to our, our original questions, it seems that temporally integration runs on its own clock. It's not sensitive in any fine-grained way to the dynamics of recognition. It actually seems to, seems to be synchronized to word onset, and nothing about the perceptual process of recognition. Algorithmically, it seems like there's a different cognitive treatment of words depending on whether they're recognizable prior to 100 milliseconds post word onset or post that time. And I'm saying my read on that is that integration accepts whatever is available at that, at that dividing line between 100 milliseconds and afterwards. In the case of early and mid, it's a fully resolved interpretation of what word's being spoken. In the case of late recognized words, it might be an unresolved interpretation, um, a, a high entropy guess about what word is, is spoken. OK, so thanks for joining me on, on this whirlwind tour through this, this modeling project. Um, I want to thank you for your attention and my PhD advi advisor, Roger, for his support on this project. And you can find much more info and more models in our preprint um, here. And I'll ask for questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Maybe um, while people are getting the bravery to ask us questions, we can have you actually take this mic. Oh, there, perfect. We have questions coming. So, John, would you come here and use this mic so that the next speaker can stand? Should I just go? I don't know. Oh, yeah, no, I think now it works. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that amazing talk. Looks like really cool. Um, yeah. Um, focus on these kind of processes of word integration. Uh, I was wondering, um, to what degree do you think um, this is safe from being expendable by other models? For example, those that would uh, in danger of appearing like a one-trick pony, take into account more low-level type of statistics of the stimulus that don't start from the annotation level, but sort of from acoustics of what people hear? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, sh I, should, I should mention we're estimating the modulation by, by surprisal. That's what I showed you here. But certainly the regression model that we're using actually is accounting for all sorts of low-level properties of the stimulus, which might be correlated with surprisal. So things like the acoustic envelope and power, it, power itself. And then actually lower-level phonetic surprisal and entropy over possible phoneme completions. Things like that are also part of the regression model. So we're saying above and beyond those low-level predictors, we get, this, uh, we get a significant improvement by splitting up a de our description of integration into these separate parts that we have a different response to late recognition. Cool. Cheers. Um, so I've seen other work um, looking at tracking of like phoneme prediction, just generally without the context of words. And I'm curious if this, uh, the way you framed it, 
Have you looked at how just phoneme, general phoneme prediction changes as a consequence of introducing this to the model, or does that make sense? Oh, I, um, yeah, I can say, so two, two points. The first is that um, the word level model here is just taking in phones as if they're ground truth. We're just saying they're already recognized. And there's certainly more richness there if we take, if we build a joint model that is, I don't know which, which category of sound, speech sound I'm, I'm receiving, let alone which word I'm receiving. Um, so that's a, that's a good model extension that we should chase. Um, in terms of concrete answers, we are estimating a neural response to phoneme surprisal, which seems pretty stable across the baseline model and this model. Um, so whatever variance we're capturing here is not actually coming from the phoneme response. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Happy to follow up more offline. All right, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, the next talk is entitled um, Teasing Apart the Representational Spaces of ANN Language Models to Discover Key Axes of Model-to-Brain Alignment. Uh, Akbal Husseini will be giving the talk, and the other authors are Noga Zaslavsky, Colton Casto, and me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Akbal, and today I'm going to tell you about the work that we've been doing with my collaborators, Noga Z <coughs> Zaslavinsky, Colton Casto, and my advisor, F. Fedorenko, on teasing apart ANN language models to discover key axes of alignment between brain regions involved in language processing. We know that language processing relies on a network of frontal and temporal regions in the human brain. We have learned a great deal about this network using traditional experimental approaches and naturalistic paradigms, but it has been challenging to go beyond descriptive verbal hypotheses. And in recent years, advances in natural language processing and AI had led have led the emergence of artificial neural networks that can generate human-like linguistic output and perform human-level diverse linguistic tasks. And this led us and others to test whether these models represent linguistic input in a similar ways to human language network. In a study done a couple years ago by a group, we evaluated over 40 neural networks against human neural data recording in fMRI and intracranially, and found that few of these models can predict brain responses to unseen sentences quite well. These high-performing models, such as GPT, GPT-2, BERT, ExcelNet, vary in their architecture, their training data, and their objective. And if we are to treat uh, different language mo models as distinct candidate hypotheses about language processing in the brain, we need to find a way to differentiate them. This is a requirement for classic hypothesis testing approach. To do this, we select seven relatively diverse models among high performing set, as shown here, and try to find a set of sentences that are represented as differently as possible across these models. So we took a corpus of 8,408 sentences and sampled a subset of 200 sentences for which we extracted the model activation from our seven models. And for each model, we used the layer that worked best from predicting brain uh, fMRI data from earlier work. And to measure whether these models represent these 200 sentences similarly, we then constructed a dis distance matrix for sentences in each model. This is a symmetric matrix, and the top triangular part of this matrix tells us how each model represents the sentences, which pairs of sentences are represented similarly and which ones um, the model trees at treats as distinct. We can compare these representational spaces between each pair of models by correlating them, for example, between GPT-2 model and CTRL. And this tells us how aligned the two models are. We can calculate this alignment for all 21 pairs of models and then summarize them as model alignment. In a, criti in a critical step, we iteratively sample a subset of 200 sentences and made adjustments so as to minimize the representational similarity across all 21 model pairs. And this approach was successful. Compared to a random set of sentences, the model-to-model -model alignment was much low, lower in the new set, which we call the misaligned set. And to better understand the nature of these sentences, we examined their linguistic properties, like average word level surprisal, average lexical frequency in, in the words, and average arousal of the words, and so on. 
and the distribution looks mostly similar to random sentences, which tells us that the sentences in the misaligned set are not some crazy weird outliers. And here are some examples for you. We, were, we presented the, these sentences in auditory version to uh, eight participants in the fMRI and recorded their brain responses. And we then extracted the responses to each sentences from language areas, which we identify in each participant with an independent language localizer. And then we followed the approach from er our earlier work where we built a mapping model, mapping from model representation to brain responses for the left out sentences. And these predictions are there compared to actual observed responses using uh, Pearson correlation. So what do we expect to see? Well, if you're trying to differentiate seven high performing models, our expectation was that one or a couple models would come out as clear winners in being able to predict brain responses to sentences better than other models. Instead, we have found that all seven models struggle to predict brain responses, yielding low brain predictivity. And for comparison, here is the predictivity for a set of sentences from our previous study, the Prera 2018 data set. And of course, we ensured that the fMRI data quality was good, as assessed by correlation between responses in different participants. And those were similar to what we have previously seen for the subjects in Prera 2018 data set. So under classic hypothesis testing, large language models struggle to predict neural responses. So what does this mean? It appears that the stimuli that are represented in different ways across models are also represented differently by all models and humans. And let me walk you through how this might work. We can consider a simple example of sentences in a two-dimensional space. In this case, four uh, sentences organized on an ellipsoid. And we can quantify the distances between different pairs shown in orange and blue arrows. Now, if you think of each model as a transformation in this two-dimensional space, say model A reduces the distance between S1 and S2, while keeping the distance between S3 and S4 the same. And the second model just transforms sentences without changing their distances. If you think about the previous optimization, we can see that S1 and S2 are organized differently between the two models. So they belong to a misaligned set. And say the language network represent these sentences as shown, given our previous result, S1 and S2 are represented differently in the language network compared to both models. But we can also consider how sentences three and four would be represented by the models. Since their distance are similar between the two models, we can say that they're aligned, they are in an aligned set. And if our intuition is in the right, right track, we can predict that their distances would be also similar in the brain. And as a consequence, the models should predict neural responses to aligned sentences better than misaligned sentences. We tested this prediction in, in two ways. First, we designed a new study with three sets of sentences, 80 each, um, and we sample new misaligned set, similar to what we did in the first study, but ensuring that none of the sentences overlap with the first misaligned set. So as to generalize the results to a new set of materials. We also sampled a set of sentences which are as similarly represented across model as possible and we call them the aligned sentence set. And finally, we sample a random set of sentences for comparison. And we again recorded the, the auditory version of these sentences and presented them in fMRI to eight new participants. And here's what we found. Indeed, for six of the seven models, no responses to, to sentences in the aligned set are predicted better than the sentences in the misaligned set. And for the majority of the models, predictivity for the random sentences falls between aligned and misaligned set. Next, we tested the generalizability of these results. So we also applied the same approach to the existing prior fMRI data set, where participants, instead of listening, read a few hundred diverse sentences. And we sampled 100 sentences from each of the experiments and we sampled three sets, aligned, random, and misaligned, and, exam and examined 
model's ability to predict brain responses for these subsets. And we found a similar pattern. Responses to sentences in the aligned set are predicted better by the models than the sentences in the misaligned set. And in an ongoing work, we are trying to characterize linguistic properties of these sentences in this aligned and misaligned sets to try to get insight into dimensions along which these uh, linguistic stimuli are represented in the models and human brain. And our initial result suggests that at least hu human participants rate aligned sentences as more frequent and more likely to happen in conversation compared to misaligned sentences. So to summarize, we've developed a method of strong inference, inference as per Platt's paper in, from six, 1964 for teasing apart artificial neural network as hypothesis about human language processing. And we use this method, method to show that models struggle to predict brain responses for stimuli that help tease them apart. And as a, as a consequence, currently no individual models can provide a reasonable hypothesis space for how the brains process language. And additionally, we have found that the degree of intermodal alignment for a set of stimuli modulates how well individual models predict brain responses to these stimuli, suggesting that a joint model representation via alignment provides a better hypothesis space for understanding how brains process language. We think this approach is promising for doing targeted search of hypotheses about human language system in this space of neural network models. And at the same time, this approach can help find the core representational axes for language stimuli in the model and the brains. And it's a general method that can be straightforwardly extended to domains outside of language. And ultimately, we hope to hone in on computational models that accurately and precisely captures the human brain responses to language. And with that, I would like to thank my advisor, F. Federenko, my collaborator, Nogazas Polinsky, Colton Casto, and my friends, at EPLAB, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Akbal. Um, questions, please come up to the microphones, and maybe um, if you can disconnect your laptop so we can have the next speaker set up while this is going on. I had a quick question, really nice talk. Um, just like, are there, could there be any other differences between the aligned and misaligned sentences? Like, when the models predict the next token of the sentence, do they do like equally well for the aligned and misaligned? Like, what makes the aligned and misaligned sentences different? Like, you had this one nice plot with surprise and so on, but like, could there be something that you could use the models for to explain differences in aligned and misaligned? Right, that's a very good question. and. We've started to look at these, these effects. But at least in terms of the optimization, it's important to notice that we are not looking for individual sentences. We're investigating how pairs of sentences are represented. And as I demonstrated, the sentences that we find, they look very natural uh, because we sort of uh, start with a natural set of sentences. And at least for human participants, um, when we look at how they rate the sentences, uh, we find that for many dimensions, they rate the sentences equally well, or the, the sort of the direction of the, uh, of the changes is not what we expected, uh, which is high for uh, aligned set and uh, low for misaligned set. But for uh, features like frequency and the probability how, of it, being a part of conversation, we see a clear pattern. Uh, but it is true that we need to sort of basically do the same test in models and see whether behaviorally they, they uh, assume they're different. Did you look at the alignment between the human subjects for the model aligned sentences and the model misaligned sentences? So is it the case that for the misaligned ones, like the humans are also different from each other in the language network? That is a great question. So there are two lines of answers to it. The fMRI responses are very consistent across subjects. And the subjects agree on how they rate the sentences. So this tells us that the 
sort of the misaligned and aligned sets, it's not about that the subjects disagree on, it's um, sort of how they uh, think of these sentences as being similar to each other or not. Um, so if you think about the brains as being just another model, um, the other model treats them differently. It's not that the sort of, uh, there's a disagreement at the individual level. Yeah, let's thank Egbal one more time. And next. <laughs> next up, we have Ines Schoenman uh, presenting work with uh, Flores de Lang and Michel Heilbronn. And the title is uh, Probing Next Word and Long Distance Prediction Using Encoding Modeling and uh, MEG. All right, can you hear me okay? Well, thank you for. Uh, being here. This is work I did within the context of my master thesis at the Dondas Institute. So, um, yeah, thank you all for your interest. And jumping right in, um, understanding language is a very difficult task that involves solving several complex problems in real time and in parallel. Nevertheless, we do that all the time with seemingly next to no effort. And one of the ideas of how we do that is by engaging in continuous next word or like in continuous linguistic predictions. Now, language, large language models such as GPT are explicitly trained um, with the objective to predict the next word or token. And recently, one line of research into linguistic predictions has capitalized on that fact and used the representations of such large language models in order to encode brain activity prior to word onset. Now, in this project, we aim to um, take a deeper look into the kind of factors that drive such um, encoding performances using large language models. And we did that um, by relying on two publicly uh, available MEG datasets. And then we also wanted to add a bit to the interpretability of um, these encoding results um, by looking at uh, what aspect um, of the linguistic prediction might be encoded here. Now, recently, Goldstein and colleagues, uh, they presented evidence for um, next word uh, predictions in ECOG data, and specifically they did that by um, showing that you can use the um, representation uh, of um, glove or um, GPT of a word in order to predict brain activity prior to the uh, onset of that word. And you can see here time on the x-axis and the cross-validated correlation between the predicted neural response and the actual neural response um, here on the uh, y-axis. So uh, what they showed is that you can successfully encode brain activity um, prior to the onset of the word even um, using one representation here uh, of their word and one, um, and the way they interpret that is um, that this encodes next word prediction, specifically also because they can show that this pre-onset encoding is sensitive to whether or not a word is um, predictable. And you can see that here by this red line um, showing lower encoding than uh, the blue line, the blue would be showing um, a predictable word as defined by GPT-2's top one prediction. Now, the encoding approach they used and uh, we used uh, as well is, first of all, um, we take our MEG data and we've relied on two publicly available data set, one data set with several subjects but only one hour of recording per subject and one data set with um, few subjects, so only three, but there we had 10 hours of recording uh, for each of the subjects. So each subject there can be seen as a replication study in themselves. Now, um, the neural data is time-locked uh, with respect to the onset of each word and then averaged as a sliding time window, so you get for each epoch this um, neural response and now, for the modeling side, we extract a representation 
for uh, each word uh, for three models that we looked at, which is GPT GLOB and an arbitrary model. And then you can take the representation of the word at onset, so here that would be methods, and you can take that in order to predict the neural response in a tenfold cross-validated ridge regression. And what you can do then um, for each time point, you can correlate um, the predicted and the actual response, and then you get these time-resolved correlation plots with uh, time on the x-axis, the cross-validated uh, correlation on the y-axis, and uh, when Either you find a positive uh, pre-onset uh, correlation here that is then taken as uh, evidence that what you are encoding here might be a pre-activation of uh, the representation of this uh, word here at onset. So um, as to our findings, so first of all, um, we could successfully um, encode uh, brain activity prior to word onset, both for GPT and GLOVE, for our single subject data set and for our multi subject data set as well. Um, so that's uh, one check for the first uh, hallmark of prediction. So um, we find pre onset encoding. And second of all, we also found that this pre onset encoding is sensitive to uh, whether or not a word was predictable. So you can see that by this red line being uh, significantly lower prior to word onset. Um, so uh, we found both, and this is in line with uh, what our colleagues uh, at the Donders found as well in Linda Kelling's group. So they're just about to publish a preprint about this. So if you're interested, go keep an eye out. However, what we were specifically interested in is uh, whether this encoding represents encoding a pre-activation of the representation of a word, so whether this is encoding a prediction, or whether um, there might be other factors which lead to the same kind of encoding results. And one thing um, which we know is that uh, neighboring model representations are correlated. So, um, Basically, what we wanted to look into here is whether uh, you can come to the same encoding results just by uh, fitting the correlation between neighboring uh, model representations. And um, we looked at this by checking how predictable um, neighboring model representations are, and this is what I'm going to call um, the self-predictability of a model. And we approached this by, again, for the modeling, taking the representations of our models, but now instead of using the MEG data, we, um, for the same epoch, we looked up for each time point the model um, representation of that uh, word, did that for each time point and for each of the words, and then for each dimension you get a time course, which you can then again um, predict based on the embedding at time point zero, and then you end up with these uh, time-resolved correlation plots again, which now are not an encoding, but they reflect the predictability of neighboring embeddings. They reflect the correlational structure within your model representations. And what we found is indeed that uh, this self-predictability mirrors uh, our encoding results both in the time course as well as in um, the differences between models. And what I show here is only this pre-onset uh, interval because this is kind of uh, what we're specifically interested in. Uh, additionally, you find the same difference um, for predictable and unpredictable words. So um, for those hallmarks of predictions we've noticed before, uh, we see that they are present in the correlation structure of the representations. Now, what this means is that actually we can explain um, those results without assuming any kind of prediction happening in the brain, in the neural signal, by, but simply by assuming that the um, yeah, but simply by uh, using these models and by having this correlational structure in the um, embeddings. Now, luckily enough, it's very easy to control for this uh, confound simply by regressing out the previous vector, and you can see this here, and now this is 
full interval pre-onset and post-onset. And what you see here is that there's an entirely flat line for the pre-onset interval, so we can successfully um, and easily control uh, for that. It's no longer possible to predict previous embeddings. And when we do that, we still see uh, pre-onset encoding for both our data set, for the multi-subject and for each of our few subject uh, data sets. Um, so this is exciting because now this suggests that uh, we cannot explain everything just by looking at the correlation uh, structure in our models, um, but this might actually present some evidence uh, that we are really encoding a linguistic prediction now. Um, two effects were that it reduced the magnitude of the effect by up to 10 percentage points, and it also reduced the differences between uh, models. So we have uh, here GPT and GLOV, two models with uh, very different feature spaces, and still their encoding performance prior to word onset is um, very, uh, very similar. So we wanted to um, probe the kind of significance of uh, the feature space uh, a bit more. So we um, constructed an additional model um, which was arbitrary, so we had um, a random vector for each word, and um, the only thing these arbitrary vectors encoded were word identity. And I want you to focus on these right uh, panels first. So what we found uh, is that arbitrary vectors actually perform strikingly well at encoding activity prior to word onset, even though there is no inherent structure in these embeddings apart from uh, encoding word identity. And um, this is, uh, in a way, a very surprising result uh, because we have very different, uh, three very different models with very different uh, feature spaces, and the only thing um, that is shared among um, these feature spaces, these representations, is that uh, all of these, in a way, encode um, the specific word, the identity of this specific word. So to us, this suggests that what um, this pre-onset encoding reflects is a form of word identity prediction. And here I want to zoom out a little bit because when we usually speak about prediction, we think about prediction in these terms of prediction being continuous and probabilistic, and this is what we have would have expected to encode here, but instead it seems that the main share of the encoding is driven by a process which is um, which is just aiming to predict the identity of a word, which then would imply that our encoding is driven by very few words our listeners are very certain about. And this is something that we are looking into now. Uh, now, um, for the second data set, we do not find um, the same um, kind of encoding. We suspect that is because of the difference in the nature um, of the um, stimulus material, which is also something we're looking into now. Uh, to wrap up, um, we've seen that brain responses can be predicted from word embeddings prior to word onset, and these are sensitive to whether or not uh, a word is predictable. However, what I've shown here is that both these hallmarks of prediction can be explained by the correlations between um, neighboring model representations. And um, what I've also shown is that this can easily be controlled for, and when we do control for this, we still find um, that there's residual pre-onset encoding, which now seems to reflect actually a prediction happening in the brain. Um, after controlling for that, we also find a very high um, performance prior to word onset for ar arbitrary embeddings, which then seems to suggest that uh, pre-onset uh, encoding performance in this model mainly captures a form of word identity prediction. And with this, I want to thank my collaborators and supervisors, and I'm happy to um, take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. I think we have maybe time for um, one question. Anybody is willing? And maybe um, Caroline can start setting up. John. Yeah. Great talk, thank you. Um, I think the idea to, re to regress out the effects of context is really smart. 
Um, I guess I'm curious what what is in the residualized glove embedding? It seems like glove's function is just to represent the context of a word. So why is it doing better than the arbitrary embedding if if you took out that? I guess what's what's the remaining differential there? What do you think? So you're saying the glove embeddings um, just present the context of the word, or are you speaking about the GPT as opposed to glove? Uh, just glove for example. Okay. Uh, yes, so basically they're kind of representing the, the feature space. So if we uh, regress out the context of uh, for glove of the one before, then um, there actually you would hope that some of the um, the structure in the glove embeddings is still uh, contained, I would say. The, do you know, like the, some, the features that are supposed to um, represent some of the semantic uh, aspects of a word, if you have like the word embedding for dog or something, then I would still expect this to be more similar to uh, cat. If you regress out the from dog, then you probably still have some of these um, semantic features left. Does that answer your question? Oh, okay. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. Let's thank her one more time. <laughs> and next, um, we have um, Caroline Lee who will be talking about hyper-HMM, simultaneous temporal and spatial pattern alignment for brains and stimuli. And this is joint work with Jane Han, Ma Fai Long, Gua Jia Hui, uh, Jim, Jim, Hebs, Jim Hexby, and Chris Baltasano. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I am Caroline, and um, I am a graduate student advised by Chris Baltasano and Jim Hexby. And today, I'm excited to share a cross lab project with everyone here. An ongoing challenge for many of us in cognitive neuroscience is the alignment of people's brain responses in our experiments. The simplest approach is to assume exact temporal and spatial synchronization across all subjects. However, this approach does not sufficiently address the spatial variability, especially in higher order regions when studying high level cognition. Functional response patterns can vary dramatically between people engaged in cognitively demanding tasks, such as watching complex narratives. Therefore, it becomes harder to assume that higher order regions are in the same cognitive states from person to person as we might for early perceptual areas. And as we continue to explore questions of high level cognition that rely on dynamic naturalistic stimuli in our experiments, we must also consider temporal variation across people. The timing of individual responses can be challenging to align in light of more complex thoughts that are not as tightly coupled with the stimuli as is the case with traditional static stimuli. Finally, another challenge is the relationship between the stimulus and corresponding responses. The noise introduced by dynamic stimuli can be addressed by identifying the features in the stimuli underlying brain responses, especially in higher order regions. One possible solution would be to map spatial and temporal features of both brain and stimuli to a common space. However, current models address the challenges of alignment in separate parts. Spatial alignment, temporal alignment, or stimulus alignment. Here we propose a model that incorporates pieces of existing alignment models in order to simultaneously align across spatial and temporal features in brains and stimuli. We use aspects of individualized neural tuning, or INT, a variant of hyperalignment for spatially aligning voxels in our models. Hyperalignment allows us to project individual voxel patterns into a shared lower dimensional space. We can then learn linear transformations that map between individuals. Although this method captures a high degree of spatial variation across functional responses, it assumes near perfect temporal alignment across people. For temporal alignment, we identify events in time course data using an event segmentation model. This model finds event boundaries in time course data with a hidden Markov model. From there, we can infer spatial patterns associated with respective events. Taking these event patterns, we can then identify the time points during which each event is most likely to come online in individual time courses. Every subject proceeds through the events sequentially 
but the timing or duration of events can differ across people. Although this model handles timing differences, it assumes that people are more or less spatially aligned. In our model, the HyperHMM, we can employ both spatial and temporal alignment methods from, from hyperalignment and the event segmentation model. However, we do not need to assume perfect spatial or temporal alignment across individuals. Here we simultaneously identify temporal alignment into event patterns in individual data and the best transformation matrices or weights to project individual event patterns into the group event representations in a low dimensional shared space G. The model updates G iteratively from the event in weight matrices E and W, learning from both individual neural responses as well as their shared latent space. Our shared matrix G represents the semantic structure of events, encoding information across individuals while abstracting away from space and time. And so we can use G to explain representations in a common space as the stimuli. Thus, we designed HyperHMM to handle simultaneous alignment with stimulus features, for which we extracted sentence embeddings from our video stimuli. So here, sentences become our unit of time, and embeddings become the spatial unit. Similar to the fMRI data, we simultaneously identify event patterns in the stimulus and the best transformation matrices to project semantic event patterns into a shared latent space of events. This creates a common space from which we can make semantic inferences between stimuli and brains. So putting it all together, we can spatially and temporally align features found in both fMRI responses and their corresponding stimuli. HyperHMM simultaneously identifies event patterns in both types of data, for which it finds the best transformation matrices to project event patterns into a common latent space representing semantic event patterns. In other words, the fMRI and stimulus features are inputs into the model which then simultaneously infers event patterns, weights, and the shared space. Although HyperHMM can be fit to any neuroimaging data set with continuous events, we chose a data set that would introduce maximal idiosyncrasies across individuals learning complex ideas. Participants were scanned several times throughout the semester, and at each scan session, they watched video lectures of their introductory computer science course. We took transcripts from each video and using a transformer language model, extracted sentence embeddings to form the stimulus features. These stimulus features, along with each participant's neural responses, serve as inputs into our model. For fitting the model, we input a list of each person's fMRI data and stimulus features. Next, we set this, the time scale of events, which can be adjusted based on the experimental question at hand, but here we wanted each event to be around 14 TRs on average. Lastly, we set the number of latent dimensions at three. Using cross-validation, we determined a lower number of dimensions around three or four were optimal for model performance. After fitting the model, we validated its performance by examining how well it generalizes event clusters from training fits to test data. We took the learned projection matrices fit to one half of our data and generalized event matrices from the other half and then plotted the latent space projections of events. Here are clusters of three example events from the angular gyrus, where circles represent individual participants. Similarly, we took the learned projection matrices and generalized event matrices and plotted the latent space projections of the stimuli. Next, we measured the distinctness of each event cluster. We used variance explained to quantify the degree to which latent space projections cluster by events. A higher variance explained means that there is more clustering of points within events, whereas a lower, a lower score means that points are more or less randomly scattered and indistinguishable between <coughs> event clusters. In the angular gyrus, we can see that the learned events in fMRI responses are significantly more clustered than null distribution. Likewise, events in the stimuli are significantly more clustered than its null distribution. When examining the same example 
events in the posterior medial cortex, we see that there are three distinct <coughs> event clusters and that there is significantly more clustering of points within events in the fMRI subjects and the stimuli as compared to null distributions. So here we have validated HyperHMM's ability to find meaningful clusters of events at the group level in both types of data and across multiple ROIs. Next, we can look at temporal and spatial alignment at the individual level. For further examination of temporal alignment learned by the model, we plot three example subjects from the angular gyrus here. These subjects have very different event onset times and durations from one another. Changes in color indicate when each person proceeds to the subsequent event in the video. Next, we show the sentences in the stimuli from the onset of each event. So simultaneous clustering of stimuli and the brain reveals a nuanced temporal relationship between stimulus features and individuals. Here we plot the same three subjects' responses and stimulus sentences in the posterior medial cortex. Again, we see a variety of event times and event onset times and durations across people. And we can see that different, sorry, <laughs> different sentences represent the beginning of each event than what we observed in the angular gyrus. So the model outputs highlight nuanced temporal differences across brain regions as well as subjects and stimulus features. Here we can visualize spatial differences across people by mapping learned projection matrices back into voxel space, enabling us to view the most informative learned latent semantic dimensions individually. In the angular gyrus, we can see that the voxel maps are somewhat similar across multiple subjects while also preserving idiosyncratic structures. We can also map the sentences in the, into the same semantic dimension. Each dot here represents a sentence and the y-axis corresponds to the first latent dimension. Colors demarcate sentences belonging to different lectures. Taking a look at a few of the most correlated and anti-correlated sentences, we can see that they roughly correspond to concrete versus abstract statements. <clears throat> Here we map learned projection matrices into the posterior medial cortex. Looking at the same three example subjects, we see again that there is both group and individual structure captured across people. Next here are the corresponding stimulus features. And unlike the angular gyrus, the most correlated and anti-correlated sentences here seem to represent future versus present tense statements. All told, the HyperHMM preserves spatial and temporal nuances in people and stimuli in multiple higher order regions while also finding meaningful group level semantic structure. In sum, the main points I'd like to highlight here are that the HyperHMM can simultaneously align spatial and temporal features in both brains and corresponding stimuli. And in doing so, the model finds a common latent space which allows for us to infer semantic information across both types of data. Our model can be flexibly adapted in many cognitive domains especially in experimental setups studying high-level cognition with dynamic stimuli. Also, we're open to testing the flexibility of our model, so we're happy to collaborate with you on your data set. And lastly, thank you to everyone here for this wonderful opportunity to share our work, and of course, to my incredible collaborators and my advisors, Chris Baldizzano and Jim Haxby. Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. Maybe Sarah can start switching and um, let's see if there's any questions. Not I might ask a question. Maybe um, I'll ask a question. Oh, good. perfect. Go, please go. Um, hi, thank you for the very interesting um, talk. Uh, I'm curious, as we may know, uh, the um, events may have different scales. So I'm curious, uh, like, what the event scales are here you defined and how accurately can this alignment work for more like some fine defined uh, fine grand um, events like some um, phrases or some words yeah can you hear me yeah that's a that's a good question so here we um we chose so the events are a parameter we chose um the number of events to reflect the time scale 
um, of information that's being um, processed in the brain. So I chose a longer time scale because I think um, we were very interested in capturing more um, abstract or con conceptual ideas that people were um, um, processing while watching um, their class lectures. Um, but if you wanted to look at much shorter time scales or finer grain time scales, you can of course adjust that, um, right, such that you're, you're capturing shorter um, time scales of information. Yeah, some that's, yeah, it's about the information. That was great, thanks. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, if you've done comparisons of, of the uh, identified latent features to just um, vanilla HMNs uh, within participant, and I, I guess my question is whether the uh, latent features that you're identifying are kind of fundamentally different in that um, uh, they're, they're, they're only the ones which are shared across participants, and there are other HMMs going, there are, there are other latent features which are unfolding separately within participants, or, or is basically your technique just a, a very nice way of finding alignment of, of features which were already existing in participants across subjects? Yeah, um, no, that's a great question. So um, I hate to call it a vanilla HMM, but my advisor, Chris Valdezano's event segmentation model, right, that is more the... the um, type of HMM I think you're relating, um, you're referring to right now. And we did use that to test earlier iterations of this model. Um, at that point, we didn't, um, yeah, we didn't use the stimulus features there. We were, it was a proof of concept just to test the model on um, a few different types of fMRI data sets. Um, but that's a good, I mean, that's a good question. What, do you expect, um, are there suggestions for stimulus features that you'd expect differences in or? No, not necessarily. I, mean, I, I guess uh, uh, it, it, it just always seems like quite quite an important problem if you if you're trying to uh, build HMMs um, that generalize across participants. Like it, 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 yeah, I think no, that's a great idea. I think yeah. um, no, we we will definitely try that. We're still working on looking at the stimulus um, alignment right now, quantitatively. So yeah, no, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Let's thank Caroline one more time. Next, we have Sarah Swaygard, who is going to be telling us about cognitive maps at multiple levels of abstraction for flexible inference, joint work with Nam Nguyen, Charan Ranganath, Suming Park, and Eri Borman. Okay. Oh. Um, so a decision that I have to make pretty regularly is what do I want to eat, what do I want to buy at the grocery store, and I've tried a lot of different foods on different occasions, and I have to find a way to sort of integrate that information in a way that's going to be helpful in my decision making. Um, and one thing to consider is that I should probably be trying to eat foods that are pretty healthy. So I have experienced at different occasions different foods, and I'm sort of aware of how they fall on this healthiness spectrum. Um, but I'm also a grad student, so I have to be also be you know, very conscientious of the price of my food as well. Um, and this will change at the beginning of the month. You know, maybe I don't care about this so much. At the end of the month, I might be a little bit tighter on my budget. Um, and so when I think about these two different attributes that I could be using to make these decisions, I could theoretically keep them separate and just sort of independently calculate when they're relevant or not, a sort of difference along this spectrum. Or I could theoretically combine them together into a shared space that I would use for making decisions. And so here, these ranks um, basically illustrate um, the location of where a food is on this price and healthiness space. And if I were to have this type of space, I could theoretically measure a distance across that, um, which would just be a Euclidean distance, the straight line distance between any two items in space. And so my work really focuses on where might we be seeing these types of distant measures in the brain under the framework of a cognitive map, the idea of a mental representation that stores information about the relationships between entities. I um, mean, there's real advantages to organizing information as a cognitive map, um, but just two I'll highlight is the idea of inferencing and generalization. So if I try another food, I can pretty quickly integrate it um, into this space and understand how it relates to different foods. So my big question is, how does the entorhinal cortex, hippocampus, and medial prefrontal cortex store and flexibly use abstract cognitive maps? I'm focus focusing on these ROIs because they've been long implicated in cognitive map research, particularly the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus in spatial navigation of abstract and physical spaces, the hippocampus in inferencing and um, relational memory, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex in value-based decision-making, et cetera. 
Um, but I'm actually not gonna have participants learn about food, I'm going to have them learn about wines. So I have this wine space that has this sweet to dry axis and this light to full axis, and each wine's location gives you information on how it scores on these two sort of separate dimensions. So when I have this sort of big overarching question, I also have to operationalize that in the context of my experiment, which is to say how flexible or static are cognitive map representations when changing task goals and policies. So if I look at these same ROIs again, and I think about those two distance measures that I initially introduced, this idea of rank along a single axis, um, and Euclidean a distance across the shared axis, I'm gonna talk about the idea that the Euclidean distance is a context independent or static representation. It doesn't care, you know, if I'm really prioritizing one axis or the other, the representation should be consistent. But I can contrast that to rank distance, the idea of a context dependent or flexible representation that will vary depending on how I have preference for one axis or another. Um, and out of this uh, sort of falls a couple different potential hypotheses, things like maybe that the antirrhinal cortex has a static representation um, that is flexibly bound to items in the hippocampus um, and medial prefrontal cortex given the context, or things like maybe the hippocampus and antirrhinal cortex having a static representation that's used flexibly by the medial prefrontal cortex, or the possibility that they all might represent some level of flexibility. So in my task, we have participants learn this space. They don't get to see it, we don't tell them about it, or we don't like tell them the shape or anything like that. Instead, they have to basically build it and infer it from their um, a really slow process of learning. And what happens is that they learn each wine or wine comparison in a given context um, during learning, they're not like necessarily together. They are aware that sweet and dry are opposites of each other, the same being true about light and full, um, but it's sort of up to them to sort of use that information um, if they need it. Basically, once participants are completed this task and they're really good at sort of inferencing across this space, we move them to our actual task. The idea here being that there's different countries that have different preferences for wine and you should be able to pick which ones are more valuable. Obviously, these are made up. <laughs> they're not indicative. They're sort of you know, randomized for each subject as, as are the placements of the wine. But the idea here is that different countries have different preferences. We also have these other countries that equally weight two different dimensions. I unfortunately don't have time to talk about that today, um, but you can look forward to that in upcoming you know, research and publications. So the idea here is on a given trial, um, in this case the context of Germany, participants will see, be aware that they're in the context of Germany which prioritizes the fullness of wines. They'll see two wines and they just simply need to say which one's preferred. Participants are very good at this so they should be able to say that it's the first wine route here. So here, once again, the idea is that that Euclidean distance is gonna be that straight line distance across the space, but this distance along this fullness axis, which is flexible and changes depending on which dimension we're asking about, um, is going to be our rank measurement here. So the first question I'm gonna look at is what brain regions are involved in inferencing at the time of choice? And so that's to say, at the time that the participants see wine two, so they see two wines, um, where do we see rank difference in information? So the difference in that context between wine one and wine two, and we're gonna look at where in the brain is that paramagically modulating brain or bold activity. And we find that in the medial prefrontal cortex and bilaterally in the hippocampus um, as a, along with some other areas as well. So this is suggesting that at the time that the participants are actually making a decision, they have the hippocampus and the medial prefrontal cortex are reflecting that difference in rank value um, that's gonna be actually relevant to the decision um, that they're calculating. Then next, what most of my work, uh, most of this talk is gonna focus on is this idea of how are cognitive maps represented in the brain, and I'm going to use representational similarity analysis. Um, the idea here being that um, you can look at fMRI data and see a pattern of activation and sort of um, compare those uh, activations together based on a specific hypothesis. So just an example of how we sort of set this up, if I take all 16 of my wines, I can basically line them up um, and create this bigger matrix. So the idea here is an average representation for wine one in the context of sweet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, participants do this twice, so this is a cross-session um, comparison that we're looking at here. Um, but then you can sort of generate hypotheses based on these different distance measures. So for example, a static Euclidean representation is going to look something like this because it's context independent. You see the same pattern um, over and over and over again. Um, and if you were to look this, this tiny little yellow box here, which is wine one in the context of full, full and wine one in the context of light in this matrix, um, it's dark blue, suggesting that they're very similar because for Euclidean distance, they are effectively the same wine. You can contrast that to this really flexible rank map, which as you can see, has a totally different pattern um, that is reflective of the fact that there's constantly changing rank values. 
So I'm going to use a GLM on these RSA predictions, and we include other things like context and wine identity that might be relevant. And we're just going to be trying to predict brain activity. Um, we can apply masks, such as including every possible comparison, but also sometimes we'll want to limit that in the case of potentially a within context comparison, where we've basically masked off some of these comparisons um, to answer slightly different questions. So I'm going to highlight three different um, analyses that I did. Here is a sort of flexible 1D within context representation, which is going to be looking for a specific context-dependent rank representation. A flexible 1D rank representation, which is looking for sort of a general representation of rank. Um, and the static 1D Euclidean, which is going to be looking for that context-independent representation. So if we look at this first matrix, the interpretation should be that a wine high and sweet is not represented similarly to a highly valued wine in any other context context. And we're seeing this in the medial prefrontal cortex, particularly in that same area that we saw in the univariate effects, suggesting that this is representing not only that it is a wine in the context of sweet, but that it's also specifically wine one or rank value one in the context of sweet. So really decision related, um, highly specific type of information. So suggesting that they had the medial prefrontal cortex is this specific context relevant um, rank information. And then if we look at this one, which is we've removed the mask and now we're doing all possible comparisons, the interpretation being that a wine high-valued and sweet will be represented similarly to a wine high-valued and dry, full, and light. So I don't care what the context is. What I care about is in that context is this high-value or low-value. And we see this in the uh, entorhinal cortex, specifically the left entorhinal cortex, which is suggesting that the entorhinal cortex has this fully abstracted, generalized representation that's coding for rank regardless of the context, that this is something very flexible that is being reflected um, in the entorhinal cortex. And then I'm also going to mention this analysis um, in the, for the Euclidean distance, same idea, no mask applied, um, that a wine will be represented the same in every country context, looking for something quite static. Um, and we see this in the entorhinal cortex, um, in addition to some other areas, suggesting that the entorhinal cortex has this context-independent representation that codes for rank value regardless of the context. And if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that I just mentioned the same brain area being shown up in the same GLM for two different models. Um, and so we were, while these are both hypothesized predictions that we had, it's a little interesting that they're both there. Um, so we wanted to look into this a little closer to say that they're not that correlated. They're only a correlation of 0.6, but maybe that's really important variance that's like explaining a lot of this. So we decided to do, and oh yeah, as you can see, they're actually quite overlapping um, areas here. So we decided to follow up with a cross-context analysis where we basically have removed this within context comparison that carries a lot of the um, variant or a lot of the correlation. And we even partialed out um, any remaining effects to the point where now the correlation is very small, um, only a correlation of point, negative 0.06. Um, and when we do that, when we've totally removed as much as we can, we find that the map looks the same. So <laughs> this is suggesting that the entorhinal cortex is maintaining both a static and flexible representation. So this sort of begs the question of what is going on here. Um, there's a couple different things that you could predict. You could predict, um, for example, that maybe the entorhinal cortex is representing something static. It's also maybe the site of a transformation that's occurring. Um, it's also possible that maybe they're both there, but you know, doing something slightly different. But another possibility is that some participants are rank people and some participants are Euclidean people, and these are group level statistics, so they're just sort of getting washed out here. So we followed up with another analysis um, where we looked in these this ROI. Um, and so this shared spot here, and we decided to plot based on peak, mean peak activation for these two different maps. Um, and so in theory, if participants generally fell into being one or the other, the map would look something like this. You'd have some participants who'd be low for rank, but then high for Euclidean, and then the reverse, low for Euclidean, high for rank. And when we look at the subject's data, what we see is no. That's not really the case. There's not really any evidence that participants seem to fall into a group of rank or Euclidean. In fact, there seems to be something going on where participants have some level of both. There seems to be some level of representation for rank as well as some representation for Euclidean. Um, and so, well, there it is. <laughs> um, and so just to summarize what I've sort of talked about here is this idea that the medial prefrontal cortex and hippocampus at the time of decision seem to be reflecting this context-dependent rank comparison. Um, and this pairs nicely with this RSA analysis suggesting that the medial prefrontal cortex has this specific context relevant rank code that's remapping between country contexts. The idea that the representation for, you know, rank one of sweet is not really at all like any other rank representations for any other countries. Um, 
And then lastly, I saw this sort of interesting effect where the entorhinal cortex seems to be showing both this context-independent Euclidean distance coding um, as well as this context-depending 1D rank coding sort of coexisting in the same space, not particularly sharing variants, um, and sort of leads us to some interesting questions about what might be going on here to sort of see these two, what in theory could be potentially conflicting representations ending up being in effectively the same space. Um, and so with that, I'd just like to thank um, my advisor, Dr. Borman, um, as well as Alex and Nam, of whom, you know, this work really could not have been done without, um, and I'll open for questions. Thank you, Sarah. Laura? Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I just wondered, how good are your participants at this task, and how long does it take them to learn it? Because it looked very challenging to me. Yeah, so our participants are, by the time that they get to the final task, they're quite good at it. Particularly in the 1D case, they're almost totally at ceiling. Um, the 2D case is a little bit harder. Obviously, I didn't have time to go into that. Um, but they have gone through a lot of hours of training at this point. Um, Probably the average participant has done at least 10 hours of like training. Um, so it's, yeah, it's hard to get participants to want to do it because it does take a long time, but the ones that we have have been really valuable. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let's start switching. Hi, thank you, super fascinating work. Um, I was curious if you looked also at the irrelevant dimension. So you have the 1D rank, but you could split the RSA and maybe even modulated by how long since the last time this context appeared, because there's different ranks for the same perceptual input, right? But maybe that would be an effect modulated. And I wonder if that could then theoretically correlate with some of the 2D effects. Yeah, so our participants are very good at this task. We do, not shown here, we do sometimes include um, an irrelevant rank value in our GLMs as well, um, not particularly seeing uh, meaningful effects. So the idea that you're not really seeing, when you're supposed to be paying attention to, to sweet, you're not particularly seeing huge effects for like light um, and, and uh, full. Um, so I think that it, the other thing is that in our task, participants are doing basically um, sweet and dry blocks intermixed. So I think it would be a little bit difficult to pull out irrelevant given that there would be constantly sort of changing whether or not they cared about 1D or 2D, um, you know, those types of trials. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, could you please talk a little bit more about the individual differences in behavior? Is there any, like, variance in there? In terms of behaviorally, um, there's not too much difference by the time that the participants get to be good at this task. Um, everybody sort of follows very closely, like I said, for 1D. We've considered looking at, you know, potential individual differences, but the fact is that, quite honestly, participants get to be so good at the task, there's not really much variance that we've been able to look into. Um, this is pretty much the only individual difference measure we've found that we've been able to sort of tease apart meaningful differences. We have looked at like training data to see if we can find um, trajectories where participants like, because they learned in a specific order, they were certainly better at some things and we haven't really been able to find any effects in that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. And last in the session um, is a talk by Tia Gong, who will be telling us about uh, spatial neglect from a Bayesian perspective with co-authors uh, Bonan Zhao, um, Robert McIntosh, and Christopher Lucas. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you. So today I'm going to talk about how we apply the Bayesian model to a clinical task for the diagnosis of spatial neglect. So spatial neglect is a task, it's a phenomenon about the asymmetry of attention away from the left side. It typically results from the right hemisphere brain damage. So if you ask a, a, a neglect patient to drop something, they might omit some details on the left side. And uh, similarly, if you ask them to do the consolidation task or copying task, they will notice more detail on the right side than the left side. Um, but one of the simplest tasks is the live bisection task that is 
The participants will be asked to mark the midpoints of a line presented in front of them. And uh, for uh, neglect patients, they typically uh, mark the um, answer right word to the true midpoint. Uh, it's explained as a compression or distortion of the left side representation. And uh, we can calculate the directional bisection error, the DBE, as a traditional measure for this task. That is the distance between the answer and the true midpoint. And despite it being widely used for the diagnosis, there's some debates about the directional bisection error measure. The first thing is that he has very low correlation with other tasks of the special neglect diagnosis. Uh, the second thing is that it failed to explain the crossover effects. That is that sometimes the patient will have a right word answer to the midpoints rather than they will have the left word answer to the midpoints rather than the right word answer. And uh, as you can see here, uh, when the stimuli is alone, then the, and the patient's will have a larger dB, and uh, when the stimuli get shorter and shorter, the dB also gets smaller and sometimes become negative. So how we explain this puzzle? So um, from many previous studies, they only manipulate the length of the stimuli and always put the stimuli on the middle of the page. But when Robert McIntosh and colleagues they manipulate the left endpoints and the right endpoints independently. They find a very uh, obvious pattern that the patient's answer are more sensitive to the right endpoints manipulation to the left endpoints manipulation. So instead of assuming that the patient has a distorted, uh, compressed, but precise left endpoints perception, Maybe the patient just have no idea where the left end point is. And uh, they have this very high uncertainty on the left side and they might use some other knowledge to help them make decision. So I think this idea is very consistent with a Bayesian perspective of perception. It says that the perception involves both bottom-up input and top-down expectation. And the prior expectation will be very important, especially when the evidence is ambiguous. So I'll give you an example here. I borrow an example from this new textbook of Bayesian perception by Wijima Kona Coding and uh, Daniel Goldberg. So imagine that you see someone far away and you are um, wondering whether it is your friend or not. From the evidence itself, it's very um, ambiguous because you're very can See, no, you can see nothing. But maybe you will have an expectation that your friend has told you that they will meet you here um, at this time point. And given this expectation, you might be more certain it is your friend. So it is very similar in the live session task because for this task, you need to perceive the left and the right endpoints to make a decision. But for the neglect patients, they will have a higher uncertainty on the left side, and they might use some prior to help. So as shown here, that uh, when perceive the left and the right endpoints, you will have uncertainty, and the way a model is used, Gaussian distribution, uh, with a very important parameter here, the sigma, the variance parameter, on both left side and the right side. And for the neglect patients, the uncertainty increase, and as the uncertainty uh, get higher and higher, it's uh, become more difficult to make a decision. And we assume that some expectation might be help. The first expectation is the light dance. So maybe uh, the participants will expect how long the light would be. And the second prior is that the participants might uh, expect the uh, mid midpoint of the light would be a align with the midpoint of the page, um, but we didn't find a large contribution of the second prior, so I will de-emphasize that in the later report. So according to these assumptions, we can build a um, Bayesian observer of the uh, task as a 
And as a researcher, we actually have the data from the participants, their midpoint responses, and we also know the true left and the right endpoints of the stimuli. So we can reverse engineer the um, left side and the right side uncertainty or any prior parameters for each individual. So we will try to fit um, different parameters for individuals and uh, hopefully these new parameters could serve as new indexes for the live accession tasks. So we remodeled the data from Macintosh and colleague from 2017. It includes um, right hemisphere stroke patients and uh, healthy control. And uh, there were four types of different stimuli in the live accession task. So for the results, we first analyzed the left side uncertainty and the right side uncertainty. That is the sigma L and sigma R. For healthy control, they have both low left side and the right side uncertainty. That's why they can manage to do this task well. But for the stroke patient, their uncertainty on the left side is much higher. Um, this is consistent with the definition of special neglect. And we also find that we can use these parameters from the Bayesian model to classify whether an individual is from the health uh, control group or the stroke patient group. And the accuracy is much higher than a traditional DBE measure. We also find that the parameters from this Bayesian model can correlate well with other tasks for the spatial neglect, such as the constellation and the copying or drawing and the correlation coefficients are also much higher than the DBE measure. And then we analyze the line length expectations from, uh, for the healthy control and the stroke patients. We assume that the line length expectation follow a gamma distribution uh, with a mean parameter and a variance parameter. And uh, here each line represents one individual. For the healthy control, um, their light expectation are um, quite consistent with each other, and uh, it also central around the uh, true light dance of stimuli on average. It means that the healthy participants can um, be flexible to update their expectation given previous trials. But for the stroke patients, their um, uh, expectation is much shorter and also stronger. It means that they were less flexible to update their um, prior given previous evidence. Um, I will follow show this with two individual examples. So for the left side, it is a healthy control. Participants, you can see their answer is much uh, very accurate. And if you calculate the distance between their answer and the right endpoint, you can see it varies according to the stimuli stance. And on the right side, the stroke patients, according to our model, their light dance prior is quite strong. And if you also calculate the distance between their answer and the right endpoints, you can see um, it's quite consistent and similar to each other compared to the health control. Uh, it means that they might mainly rely on their prior expectation and to combine this expectation with their precise right endpoints to make their uh, live accession decision. Importantly, we can see here that m many of their answers were actually on the left side of the midpoint rather than the right side. Um, it means that the paradoxical or mysterious uh, crossover effects might just be um, the fact that they rely more on the expectation to make the decision. So to summarize, uh, we here provide a Bayesian model for the live accession task, and uh, we think it's a unified account for the behavior of both the stroke patients and the healthy controls, and it can help accurately classify the individuals. It also correlates well with other neglect tests and uh, capture the crossover effect. And in the future, we think it would be a very helpful framework because we can 
use it to explain that your imaging data. And uh, because it is a um, generative framework, so we can use it for the simulation to provide some guidelines for task administration. And uh, we might also be able to apply this to other special neglect tasks. Okay, and here are references, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. Questions? Thank you. Re really interesting. I was just wondering whether you think you'd find similar effects in people who had a hemianopia, for example, or even in healthy people who have some ob you know, obscuration so they can't see the other side. Do you think they would have a similar kind of behavior or different? You mean for Sorry, the, the, would you be able to fit their model and find they, they're doing the same sort of thing that neglect patients do? In other words, you don't have information for any reason. Would you behave in that same way? Uh, you mean we can manipulate uh, healthy people to... Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So for... Um, so for healthy people, so typically, actually, there's another phenomenon called pseudo-neglect. That's for normal people, usually we have more attention to the left side of our field than the right side. And uh, um, so if we um, try to emphasize that, maybe the, um, the healthy people will show the other way around in their life. Uh, like by session task, but we haven't, um, haven't tried to manipulate that so far. But thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks Another for question? the really interesting talk. Let's just start just curious, if, if you ask one of these patients to draw a line on the left-hand side of the line, so rather than bisect it, but identify the edge on the left-hand side, how would they do? I mean, the, you know, the assumption is they don't see the left-hand side, so I'm just curious if you just specifically ask them, put a line on the left-hand side at the edge of the line, would they, would they mis misdraw where the end of the line was? Yeah, I think um, behaviorally there was tasks down on the left-hand uh, left side, so you can, put, you can put the line on the left side, on, on the middle, or on the right side of the page. Um, yeah, so I'm just saying, you, you keep on, you, you've been describing they misrepresent where the midpoint is, yeah. and you're assuming that they're neglecting the left-hand side, but a more direct question is just to ask them, put a line on the left-hand side. I'm, I'm just wondering how people would respond to that question. I'll try to um, find the left end points of the line. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they also perform poor in the task. We have done that. So, it, and they were more accurate in um, find the right end point, then the left end point is also a good task to explore. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Maybe uh, one last question while we switch for the closing remarks, but can you please, sorry, can you please test? Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, um, so I'm just wondering about uh, how well you think this model generalizes to the whole symptomology of hemispatial neglect. Uh, so presumably uh, the left-right asymmetry is, you know, in, in ma many of these symptoms. Do you think it um, generalizes, for example, to the, the, the clock task um, and maybe for more, uh, asking them to identify, um, you know, uh, like what's in your left uh, visual field and, and maybe even more to like more complex behavioral deficits? I'm just wondering um, how well do you think this can be used? Because it seems very promising, but I'm just wondering what you think about generalizability. So thank you. So this framework emphasizes that the neglect um, is more related to the attention bias than the distortion or compression of the uh, left side. So I think it would be very useful if we want to uh, explore that in other tasks to um, distinguish whether neglect is really an attention phenomenon or a compression phenomenon. And uh, of course, the task we use here is quite simple, but hopefully we can use more technique, like a two-dimensional, um, yeah, Bayesian model to model more um, complex tasks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tia. That was a, a lovely epic round of six talks, and for the people who have been here the whole time, 
I have, uh, some of you have too. I know we all need a stand up and stretch break before we go right into the next one. So I'm gonna take a minute, stand up, walk around, but then I'm gonna go right into the talks. But yes, thank you. I, <laughs> some people have been here and sitting for three hours. Do a little stretch, say hi to your neighbor. Don't leave. That's important. It will help. Start to go back. Hello. Uh, one minute warning. Start to wrap up that lovely conversation and head back to your seats. Thank you. time. Everyone, please take your seats. Please. It's working. Amazing. It's working. <laughs> it was worth it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, we find ourselves on the last day, nearing the end of the last set of talks on CCN 2023. And it's my privilege as the co-chair of CCN 24 to get to give the closing remarks of this conference. So when you're organizing a conference and looking back on how it went, it makes you realize you had some goals. One, that the science was shared. 
Um, one thing that I really love about CCN is that so much of the programming is member initiated from the keynotes and tutorials to the GACs to the posters to the talks um, and not just the science itself but also you know the broader content that we value from the diversity to the uh, lunch to the climate um, GAC and so really the content is the common core of what brings us together and I think from my perspective, I'd put a solid check mark on this one. Um, I think we can safely say that science was shared and there's an impressive um, sort of early career researchers that make the future bright. Um, the second goal, of course, is that fun was had, by which I mean we talked about our science. <laughs> We are all big nerds, and it turns out the fun thing is talking about the posters and going to the talks and sharing our science. And also, <laughs> amplifying that, not just the science, but the broader context that we find ourselves in as social people who like to sing and dance and take boat rides. Um, and um, of course, the third goal is uh, to leave inspired and ready for the next year. Um, and so we've had the privilege of being in so many lovely places. I know Oxford is my first time here and it's so charming and has a special place in my heart from now on. So where will 2024 be? <laughs> Before I can tell you that, uh, some serious thanks are due. First, um, these are the names of the people that have been running around in the very cool red shirts that we all are a little bit jealous of, um, who have been really just making this conference go, telling you for the hundredth time how to get to the North Schools and where to, where, you know, all, all of the things. Um, and of course, the AV team and the caterers and servers and the support staff and all the people that sort of make the experience flow so wonderfully. So I want to give a special um, thanks uh, to the local organizing. <laughs> Stand up, please, if you're here. Chunked ourselves into different committees, organized by different people to help sort of divvy the workload. Um, and this is all service-based, and these are the people that have really put a lot of the work leading these different committees. And so I wanted to give a special call out to the CCN committee chairs for making this possible. Stand up. You don't have to. <laughs> And the committees, of course, are populated by other people doing lots of work, too, and it's really quite important to acknowledge the whole team of people that really made this um, happen. Um, and so thanks to the whole CCN 2023 organizing team. And of course, our fearless leaders who've really chaired this um, finding the location, scouting it, making all the production go, all the pieces fit together, Chris Summerfield and Lawrence Hunt. Tireless leaders, thank you. <laughs> Finally, um, it's important to acknowledge the CCN 2023 sponsors. We're, the more sponsors, the more people can come and the easier it makes this and the more accessible the science and we want to thank these and, and keep coming and bring your friends sponsors and thank you to the sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of next year, many of you I think have maybe had some guesses about where it might be. I will give you, um, I think your priors might lead you in the right direction, but I will now reveal that the next CCN will be in Boston, <laughs> first week of Boston. <laughs> And in particular, we're going to hold it at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We've um, found the Kresge Auditorium, which has a capacity of 1,000. So we're ready for an increasing community as it seems to be happening. And um, so it will be at MIT Kresge Auditorium and the surrounding um, student center. So 
CCN24, organizers so far include myself and Ev, um, Nicolas Shuk from the program committee, Jan Charest on the technical committee, Kim Stackenfeld on the communications committee, and maybe you. Um, we need, we are gonna start sort of filling out the teams and thinking about not just this upcoming year, but the next year. So yeah, as you feel part of the community and tied to it, you know, think about volunteering. There's gonna be a post-conference survey and room to volunteer yourself or others. Um, and uh, it's quite fun. Um, and uh, so keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and finally, let's turn to the third goal, which is leaving you inspired and ready for next year. Um, and of course, we like to talk about our science and have our fun. And what better way to end, I think, than with Stan DeHen? Well, it would be normally quite a large amount of pressure to say, okay, inspire the whole audience. I believe Stan can handle it. And after Stan's talk, we'll have a community meeting. Now, the community's really been growing, um, and we had so many this year that the venue, we just didn't even anticipate this. And so that actually means there's quite a lot of choices for what we want to do as it gets bigger, how do we want to change and adapt, and, um, and what do we want to keep the same. And so these are the kinds of things we'd love to hear, what your values are and what you're wanting and liking and wanting to add, and um, that will happen right after the um, last keynote. And so right on time. And without further ado, um, whoever's introducing Stan Dehaene, please come up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our final keynote speaker of this year's CCN conference, Professor Stanislas Dehaene. So Stan is a professor and chair of experimental cognitive psychology at Collège de France and the director of cognitive neuroimaging unit at Neurospin. His research has touched upon many fundamentally human cognitive capacities such as language, mathematics and conscious reasoning. And in each of these domains, Stan has made a huge and often paradigm shifting contribution to the field's understanding of how these processes are implemented in the brain. Stan has received numerous prestigious awards and honors in recognition of his major contributions to cognitive neuroscience, but Stan, I promised that I would keep this short, um, so I encourage you to look those up. <laughs> Um, Stan is also the author of several popular science books, um, including How We Learn, The Number Sense, and Reading in the Brain, exemplifying his major contributions to sharing scientific discovery with the general public. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Stan Dehan. Thank you so much. This is really a great honor and pleasure. I would like to thank Leila, Chris, Lawrence, all of the organizers for being here. Um, and uh, it feels strange to speak after the closing remarks, so I'll, I'll try to unclose the meeting. Uh, I, I, it's also strange, it's like being late at an examination, perhaps. And I, since we are in examination room, I, I cannot help thinking of the generations of students that have suffered in this room and, <laughs> and, and looking at these clocks which I think are there purposely to make sure you're sweating. So I, I will be also be looking at these clocks and I hope you won't be looking too much at these clocks but we'll try to stay on time. Can I have the first slide? I'm not sure how, or maybe I can do it myself. Hmm. Something is wrong. you know how to do it? I have it here. Something is, oh, here we go. Is this working? At least it's working here, but now. Struggling. Here we go. Excellent. All right, so yeah, I'm very interested in the human brain and what's special about the human brain. I'd like to tell you a little bit about this in this talk. Uh, when we think about the specialness of or singularity, as I like to call it, of the human brain, we often think of language. 
spoken and later written language. But I, I want to argue that there are many, many languages in the brain and uh, that there is a language of math, a language of geometry, which we can see, for instance, if you visit the Lascaux Cave in uh, the south of France, you will see these beautiful animal paintings. We are already symbolic and abstracted, but you will also see this incredible rectangle. Anthropologists know if they see a rectangle that was a human. No other animal will make these sort of symbolic shapes. Uh, likewise, music is another of these languages that has very long prehistory in humans. Uh, these flutes are something like 30,000 years old. And uh, all of these, I would like to argue, are equally singular human languages that uh, make us special and require uh, a special hardware, perhaps, in the brain. Um, now, we think we begin to understand these languages because we have large language models. And uh, Jay McClellan yesterday was showing some enthusiasm about uh, these models, um, but some moderate enthusiasm. And I think we all have moderate enthusiasm. For instance, there is this paper just out uh, last week uh, showing that uh, uh, large language models can pass some exams. And yet, when you look closely, uh, whenever the questions include math, uh, they have trouble. They are not uh, zero, they, they don't get uh, such a bad grade, but they, are, they have trouble with mathematics. And this is also my experience, and I'll show you several examples of that, um, to suggest that there is a, a problem with designing uh, models for the language of mathematics. I just want to entertain you with my discussion with ChatGPT3 on fractions. Uh, I asked ChatGPT, what's larger, two fourths or one half? And uh, ChatGPT, one half is larger than two fourths. Uh, two fourths can be written as two fourths, which is equal to one half. Therefore, one half is equal to two fourths. That's very inconsistent. So I say, well, didn't you just contradict yourself? Oh, I apologize. I made a mistake in my previous answer. Two fourths is smaller than one half. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Two fourths is equal to one half, since one half is larger than two fourths. It's just complete gibberish, basically. <laughs> You know, and you can try it for yourself. It sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. You don't really understand why. And you know, this, is, this is really strong limitation. Uh, there is another paper recently showing that the ChatGPT cannot do three-digit multiplication. Uh, it's really strange that this sort of simple but algorithmic uh, aspects are not well captured. So um, I've been trying to argue that there are multiple languages of the brain in this recent TIX paper with my colleagues, many of whom are here. Um, and the idea is that uh, aside from the classical uh, spoken language networks, but by the way, by themselves, can be decomposed into phonology and syntax and semantics at the minimum, uh, we also have more dorsal language systems that are involved in uh, the symmetrical structures of mathematics and music. And uh, that, therefore, they require a special treatment, distinct treatment. They may have shared principles, such as the discretization of concepts in symbols and the capacity to compose these symbols recursively. But they also have differences, such as the use of symmetry and repetition in the case of language, which actually is actively avoided uh, in the case of mathematical language, I'm sorry, uh, which is actively avoided in the case of natural language. Um, so, uh, what I will try to convince you today is that we have a special human machinery. Uh, as our brain was growing, it's not just larger, but the circuits must have been changing to accommodate uh, new uh, properties, new functional properties. Of course, we have a lot in common with other animal species, and I've insisted on that in my previous work. Uh, we have several core knowledge systems, in the, in the words of Elizabeth Spelker from Harvard, we have circuits for space and numbers, probability objects that are largely shared. We also have, I've claimed in the past, a conscious global workspace, which is uh, similar to other animals, but the contents of the workspace may be different. And the reason is that we discretize the concepts, we recycle these previous concepts using mental symbols, and we recombine them to form an infinite number of nested thoughts. And this leads to the cultural explosion, which is so characteristic of human species uh, in uh, the uh, prehistory, for instance or across cultures. So I'd like to argue that there are two properties here that are both important. The first, first one is the ability to assign symbols and to do so bidirectionally. We can attach a symbol, either an internal symbol or an external one, such as a word or a sign, to any concept in both directions. And the second one is symbol composition. We, uh, by definition of what is a symbol, I would like to argue, it can enter into a complex expression together with other symbols in the language of thought. 
And I would like to argue that there is a very important concept that we need to have in our theories, which is the idea of minimal description length. The brain endeavors to compress the information, and symbols are a way to compress the information even further, to find the simplest possible expression behind a, a particular expression. So, first point is symbol assignment and reversibility. You see this painting in the Louvre, you can imagine that the Virgin is explaining the word lapin uh, to uh, Jesus. Yeah? And I hope he's learning. Yeah. So how do we learn uh, symbols? So it may, come to us, uh, it may come as a surprise to you that um, I defend the idea that uh, there are no real symbols in other animals because you know of all these incredible experiments where chimpanzees, for instance, are learning uh, tokens, indexes, um, and uh, in particular the shapes of Arabic numerals. If you see this movie here from Tetsuro Matsuzawa, uh, it's amazing to see this chimp being able to point to the proper Arabic numeral for the corresponding quantity of dots here. Um, but uh, what is not present in these animals? The first thing is that several people have argued that there is no real compositional syntax. For instance, these numbers cannot easily enter into calculations, even additions or multiplications. Um, but second, uh, there is perhaps an even more basic property, which is uh, at the foundation of symbols. They need to be reversible. If I tell you that there is a plane on the sky and you look at the sky and you see the plane, the next time you see a plane, you need to be able to retrieve the word. This is essential for bidirectional communication. It's also essential inside a single brain to go back and forth between the symbol and the meaning. And uh, it turns out that to train this chimpanzee, for instance, it was necessary to train it in both directions, from the quantity to the symbol, from the symbol to the quantity, because they would not reverse. There is a lot of evidence, uh, well, not a lot, but there's quite a few suggestions from behavior that many animals cannot do this. So I wanted to show you an experiment that we did in the lab to look at the brain mechanisms of this reversibility. Uh, the capacity to attach a symbol immediately in both directions. What we are doing here, uh, and uh, this is a paper led by Timo van Kerkourli in the lab with my wife, Gislaine, um, we uh, show a picture and we attach it to a label, such as the word bunyunyu here, arbitrary, almost. Um, we present it in a canonical order. There will be actually four such symbols, two from picture to word, two from word to picture. So here it's from picture to word. And we can test whether the subject has learned the association because we can present an incongruent label and see if it creates a novelty reaction, if the brain is surprised to have this wrong association. But then we can also present it in a non-canonical order. And in this case, the word precedes the picture. We can still ask, is there a surprise reaction when you get the wrong picture rather than the correct picture attached to the label? And this is a lovely paradigm for fMRI because it's purely passive in a sense. We're just looking at the brain, there's no behavior. Maybe in behavior you could miss the internal representation. Here you, we're looking at the whole brain with MRI of uh, monkeys as well as uh, humans. So that's the idea. Use fMRI rather than behavior to directly and implicitly probe the knowledge um, and see whether this involves language areas or a broader network. Um, so this is the full design. We have two objects that are uh, assigned two labels in the forward direction, I mean from picture to word, and two in the word to picture direction. Uh, initially, 100% of trials are of this kind, and then we move to a situation where 70% of these trials are kept, and then there's 10% incongruent to test the forward knowledge, and 10% of the others in an uh, unbiased manner to test the reversed association. And um, the data uh, is high quality as attested by this slide here, where you can see that we can isolate even though every trial in, involves one auditory and one visual stimulus, and they are separated by 800 milliseconds, we can still separate uh, auditory and visual activations just by their timing, and by putting the proper regressor uh, at, at the proper time. This is a reminder, by the way, that fMRI has a lot of temporal resolution that we don't typically use in our experiments. So well, you can see that in both monkeys in the bottom and in humans, we have high quality data. But the results are radically different in the two species. In humans, essentially the entire brain responds to surprise in a reversible manner. So you see the canonical order surprise reaction. This is the incongruent uh, trials showing more activation in this bilateral network. It does involve language areas, but also a lot of this more dorsal network that I'll be speaking about later. And you can see how bilateral it is. And it works just as well in the non-canonical direction. There is no area where there is an interaction here. 
so everything that you've learned in one direction in a symbolic uh, paradigm, you also know in the opposite direction. You get a surprise reaction when it's violated in the opposite direction. It's not at all the case in a monkey. First of all, the areas are confined to more posterior auditory and visual areas, but uh, they only work in the canonical direction. So monkeys seem to have learned the association in the canonical direction, but they have no reversibility at all. They don't realize that there's something surprising to getting the wrong association in the opposite direction. And because you could argue that this is a symbolic language task, we also replicated in the second block uh, with uh, uh, the same sort of design, but now visual to visual association. So we use lexigrams very similar to what has been used with chimpanzees, for instance. So now you associate an object with an arbitrary uh, black and white symbol here. And uh, the results are uh, also enhanced because we ask monkeys to pay attention. We reward better half of these pairs so they can predict they're going to get a better reward and they attend a bit more. But the results are unchanged in the sense that we still get, so this is experiment one and experiment two, in humans we still get uh, no interaction, essentially complete reversibility, so a congruity effect on the reverse trial. Uh, when it's purely visual, it's a more dorsal network, not so much the language areas now, but just uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex on both sides and some activation in the trapahital sulcus. But in a monkey, you get no such reversibility. And it's not just a null effect, it's a positive interaction uh, showing that the monkeys are really different. Yeah. Um, by the way, it's also an illusion. So if I just ask you how frequently these trials were presented, this is what we did in this subject here, we uh, typically know that some trials were presented 70% of the time, but we think that the reverse trials were also presented in the opposite order. So it's really a sort of illusion. When we deal with symbols, we think that they should be reversible. We don't even see that there is something wrong about it. It's a bit bizarre because if A, then B, if B, there is no obvious conclusion, but when it comes to symbols, you have to have this reversibility. So we think this is one of the key properties that already may be basic enough to distinguish us from our other non-human primates. Of course, this needs to be further tested, and it would be nice to have chimpanzee data. Uh, my wife, Gislaine, does have baby data to suggest that this is a very early property, reversibility, which is already present in the first few months of life. Second part. Uh, I wanted to tell you that uh, we think that symbols must compose. And there's something very particular about humans being able to compose symbols, for instance, to create uh, these beautiful representations of the zigzag or the spiral, uh, or zigzag with an head or with a circle at the end. Uh, they are obvious examples of composing geometrical symbols. So we started to think about this uh, with Maria Malrik uh, several years ago. How could we find a very, very simple test, a test that even children could pass, and perhaps even monkeys, but uh, that would not involve language, but still would involve this sort of concept of composition in the language of thought. And we came up with a variation of what is called the Corsi blocks, spatial working memory, where you see a sequence and you have to remember what you saw or even anticipate what's going on. So uh, let me show you this example. You are a little child now, so you see this fish hiding in little ponds. We tested this in preschoolers. And um, you are going to have to decide where it's going to come next. Okay, so let's try to see this. Okay, do you know where it's going next? I bet you do, yeah, everybody does. It's going here and here and here. And uh, if it doesn't, you're surprised, uh, even though it's arbitrary, right? And uh, furthermore, it allows you to memorize this sequence very well. So if I just presented you the eight, uh, you would remember it very well. Um, it turns out that uh, this is peculiar to that sequence because it is regular, and we need to account for the sense of regularity of these sequences. We tested a lot of different sequences, including some that are completely irregular here in the sense that they have no geometrical uh, regularity, and then your memory is severely challenged. So it's only because you can compress the information that uh, you can remember it in your memory. But what does it mean to compress? We tried to uh, define the minimal properties that are needed, and we found that we needed some kind of recursive language, a language that has a knowledge of minimal geometrical and numerical primitives, one, two, three, four, as well as the symmetries around an axis. For instance, you need a symmetry around the vertical axis or the diagonal axis to explain the zigzag that I showed you, and a capacity for nested loops 
for several times. For instance, the zigzag is repeat four times that I repeat twice a symmetry operation. Okay. And if we don't have this, we can't really account for the memory of the subjects. If we do have it, we can account for a lot of data. We can account for the memory of the subjects. We can account for their anticipation. I, I did not point this out, but I think it's important in the context of discussions of AI. This was not even single trial learning. Right? You saw half of a trial of a new task, but you were able to anticipate what's coming next. If you just present the, these two subjects and you ask them, track it with your eyes, just place your eyes on uh, each subject successive item, they actually anticipate unconsciously and immediately move their eyes and the amount of anticipation is a direct function of the regularity. What is regularity here? We have called it complexity. Um, it's um, minimal description length. How compact is this program? What is the sum of the lengths of the individual uh, operators that are needed in this expression, in these four loops, in this little program that captures the sequence? So in several different behavioral tasks, memory, anticipation, uh, we find the same effect of uh, minimal description length. Then we went to fMRI, we scanned subjects while they're just doing this eye tracking task and implicitly they were understanding the sequence and coding it. And we found that minimal description length modulated a rather wide dorsal circuit that you can see here, bilateral involving a lot of the intraparietal sulcus and occipitoparietal areas on both sides involving a little bit of the premotor uh, and uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, I'll show in a second, going down into the inferior frontal gyrus, but staying just dorsal to language areas. And uh, we get an even better predictor if we include the non-linearity. Why should we include the non-linearity here? Because uh, it's not just that you get higher and higher with uh, minimal description lengths, but there's a moment where the sequence is so arbitrary, so complex, that first of all, you don't encode it very well, you don't remember it very well, and in fact, there is no recursion involved. There's just a list of tokens. So if we instead use as a regressor the nesting, the amount of nestings of these functions, then we get this U-shaped function, inverted U-shaped function, and we get better predictor in particular of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So you see these areas climbing up all the way until it's not possible to encode the sequence very well, and then the activation collapses. Um, we also got evidence for this parsing of sequences through MEG. MEG signals were recorded in the very same task. The subjects were passively looking at these sequences, and uh, there was occasional deviance, but I won't think about, speak about that now. But um, what you can see here is one particular prediction, which is nice. It's always a sequence of eight items. You always see eight locations, and they move around with more or less regularity. But the prediction is that the language should group these eight locations in different ways. If you see the zigzag, is grouping by two. So the zigzag is called four segments. Here it's one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, four times. But conversely, if you see two squares, and here's another square, then it should be one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The inner loop is a loop of four or a loop of two. And this makes completely different prediction for the rhythm of brain activity. But down here, what you can see in a sort of schematic manner is we were able to decode the putative indices, one, two, one, two, or one, two, three, four, from the MEG signals. And we were able to see also in the power spectrum of those signals that there is a peak at the predicted frequency either uh, the main frequency divided by two or the main frequency divided by four, depending on the predicted groupings of the items. So the Corsi block tries to randomize that, but if you really want to account for human memory, you need to have a sort of internal language that groups the item and does so recursively, makes groups of groups of groups. Um, I want to emphasize that this is really not the classical language network. So if we isolate in a subject-specific manner the voxels that respond to language in these subjects, we get very little or no activation, even deactivation in many of these areas. But if we instead have a localizer for the voxels in a particular subject that responds to mathematics, calculation, uh, then we get this very strong activation and again this profile of increasing uh, with minimal description lengths up to a certain level. So it really has more to do with the network for mathematics, which is involved here. Um, 
This is a great task because it could, in principle, be moved to the monkey, right? All you have to do is see a sequence and click on it or follow it with your gaze. And that was our idea from the start with Leaping Wong, who is uh, attached to this work from the start. Uh, Leaping was able to train monkeys to do some of this task, but not the entire task. The trouble was that monkeys would never remember an eight-item sequence, even if it's regular. So they managed to train and train and train until they got monkeys to do three item and then four item sequences and that was about it and then they begin to collapse. Um, and that's already an interesting indication. The monkeys are quite clever. And so, uh, maybe I'll cut the sound, this is not needed. You can see a monkey uh, getting a sample of two locations and then now three locations and he's able to reproduce the sequence and actually here he's reproducing the sequence backwards. Uh, the reason this is interesting as well is that this corresponds to a center embedded type of sequence, which was predicted uh, by some to be not feasible. It's a sort of center embedding structure comparable to the center embedded structures of language. I won't go into that, but the monkeys could do that. They could get a sample of three, or now you can see on the screen, four items. Even they could get new spatial organization, and they would still be able, way above chance, to remember one, two, three, four in the opposite location to the one that they got in, as a sample. So what could they not do? Well, there are several things. First of all, the sequence lengths could not exceed three or four items. After that, they began to collapse completely. Second, learning was super slow. Maybe that's fair enough because you know, they didn't go to university unlike our students, although we did have you know, preschoolers and so on, but still. But learning really here, we mean 10,000s of trials or more. It's enormous, very slow learning. The most important, I think, is that monkeys do not grasp the geometrical structures that we are talking about. So, here is an analysis that uh, Leaping and his team did um, where you can see that if you have uh, sequences of four items, you can group them according to patterns. For instance, this is the simplest possible sequence here, uh, which involves one, two, three, four, going around the circle in one direction or the other. There are six possible ways of going forward and six possible ways of going counterclockwise. The clockwise or counterclockwise, that makes the total of 12 variants of the same sequence. Well, what was happening was that there was enormous within pattern variation in the monkeys, idiosyncratic variations, whereas there was very little in the human subjects. They, they treat all of these six, 12 variants here as the same. And vice versa, there is enormous between pattern variants in the monkeys and not, uh, uh, in the humans, sorry, and not so much in the monkeys, including preschooler school children here. What you can see is that there is an ordering, a systematic ordering of uh, facility for those sequences and naturally the one that I just talked about, one, two, three, four, going around the circle is the easiest and leads to the best performance and here the trials were sorted by the children's performance. You see it still predicts the adult's performance. So human adults and children have a sense of geometrical regularity, but monkeys could not care less. They just remember the three or four locations as a list without seemingly taking into account the geometrical regularities that are involved. And this was confirmed in a very nice way, and I highly recommend this paper by Leaping Wong in Science last year to which I am uh, attached. But uh, it, uh, Leaping was able to record with his team uh, from thousands of neurons during uh, performance of this task in, in monkeys, something that we would love to have in humans, obviously, to, to compare the codes, so we don't have that yet. Um, the monkeys were performing this uh, three item sequence, and um, Leaping was able to look at the organization of the memory for these three item sequences and was able to show that you can account for the working memory for these three successive locations on a circle by uh, essentially three two-dimensional subspaces out of the thousand-dimensional space of the recorded neurons. So you could compress the information by saying there's one slot which looks like a circle here, where the activation encodes the first location, and then there is another slot that encodes the second location that you've seen, and another slot that encodes the third location. The circles get a little bit smaller, which correlates with the loss of memory. Monkeys remember better the first and the second and the third, but that's essentially all there is in the monkey memory. There is a slot-based representation, and I would like to argue that uh, this is not what humans have. Humans have a compressed representation in working memory because they have the ability to use this language of thought. So I think in this example we see quite well what's the difference with the monkey. This is a little pause.
wake you up as well. But I think you all know this music. The idea is, um, could we apply some of these ideas to the patterns in music? Oops. Stop. <laughs> so music is like a zigzag in time, zigzag in frequency space. Uh, this is quite typical, of course, of this prelude. It's really literally a zigzag in arpeggios. Uh, but um, can we sort of extend the same sort of ideas and have a language that would apply all, also to minimal music? I, I want to apologize to Bach, because these are the stimuli now that we are going to use. Um, so bear with me. Actually, the computer ate the first stimulus. So let me play this again. See if you can remember it. It's a 16 item sequence. So I'm challenging your working memory right now with 16 items. Should be way above your working memory. But see if you can remember it. The computer is eating the beginning. So I don't know why PowerPoint does that sometimes. But I hope you could remember it. I know it. Let's try another one. It's really weird when you miss the beginning. It's an interesting experiment, but the, the computer is eating the first two notes. Let's try the last one. This is a completely random one. Let's see if you, what you can do. So you are lost, right? So these are the stimuli that we've used, the sample of the stimuli. There are five experiments in this paper by Samuel Planton. But the idea is very simple is uh, we are proposing that auditory sequences are a little bit like these spatial sequences. There are only two locations here. We can extend it to more. There's only one note and another note. It's a binary language. And the idea is still maybe the same language applies. It's much simpler now because the geometric operations are stay there or move to the next node, right? But in fact, it turns out that we can apply exactly the same language with the same sort of four loops. So for instance, what you just heard, what, what I was trying to make you hear, is two pairs followed by four alternations and the whole thing repeated twice. So that's a nesting of multiple loops of repetition and alternations. And uh, our idea was maybe the same exact language will uh, manage to explain what happens in working memory for auditory sequences. So uh, it worked. It even worked also when the sequences were visual. Uh, the one way to test memory is simply to present first an habituation to a sequence several times, and then a test phase where there's an occasional deviant, and you ask objects and you detect the deviant. It's nice because it's a sort of mismatch negativity paradigm as well. Um, so what we found was that both the objective performance, detecting the deviant, as well as the subjective complexity, rate how complex the sequence seems to be, um, both of these were extremely well predicted by the minimal description length. And you can see here, we're talking about very high uh, correlation coefficients. Interestingly enough, even if you get a completely random sound, which is not part of the first two, you still get this correlation, suggesting that subjects are absorbed by the complexity and find it more difficult when uh, minimal description length is too high. And they have, a, they have to reallocate resources to the new deviant, and that takes a little bit more time. But you can see these great feats. In this case, we were able to do model fitting to this data. And so you can see here eight different uh, model fits. And uh, comparisons on the right using the AIC criterion. Um, several of these are well known. For instance, you might think that sequences can just be compressed by Lempel ziff or by entropy, uh, the measure would be entropy, and so on and so forth. It turns out that uh, the model of uh, language of thought, complexity, is better. And in fact, we found that we can tweak the model a little bit to get it a bit better. It has to respect the chunks in the start. Uh, so if there is a group of uh, three identical items, don't break them. The human brain doesn't seem to be able to break them and find an even more regular structure. That's a small variant, but basically, uh, this is showing that we have a pretty good handle on what drives complexity here. And uh, then, of course, we went to fMRI and MEG. So in fMRI, uh, first of all, we designed these uh, different sequences here. Um, you can see that the idea is that we start with very simple regularities, just repeat the same note, an alternation, which could be learned by a non-linguistic model, just by transition probabilities, like we think is driving the mismatch negativity in its earlier stages. But then we have more complex um, uh, sequences that require chunking, like two pairs, oh, sorry, just pairs, A, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, or uh, more complex ones that require nested structures, such as A, A, B, B, A, B, A, B, which I made you listen to 
uh, too many times already. Um, what are the predictions? The predictions is that there should be an increase in the activation to the encoding of the internal model because it gets harder and harder to encode as uh, the complexity gets higher with, once again, a drop at the end because that drop is essentially saying, I can't encode. Uh, it's too complex to be encoded. And vice versa, for the violations, that should be exactly the opposite prediction. If you have a weak model and you have a weak prediction, then you are not able to detect the violations. So this is a very clear signature of these uh, complexity effects here when we measure both the activation to the standard sequence and to the deviance, to the violations. And that's exactly what we got in fMRI. So you can see this whole brain network here that has uh, the signature of increased uh, complexity, but also, as you can see, a response in a decreasing manner with complexity to the deviance. So it's, it gets harder and harder to encode these sequences, and there is this little drop at the end, so a little quadratic here, and uh, the violations follow the exactly opposite pattern. It's exactly what you would get out of predictive coding, but predictive coding which is based on the notion of uh, complexity based on the language of thought. The network is bilateral. It involves some of the same components as before. Um, so you can see uh, these uh, intraparietal activations on both sides, these uh, precentral activation going down towards Broca's area but stopping short of language areas are almost there. And uh, now it's connected to a superior temporal sulcus because this is an auditory sequence and not a spatial visual sequence. And you also see some very interesting patterns in the cerebellum here. Um, again, if we look for overlap with the language network on the left and with the mass network on the right, we see that there's much more overlap with the mass network. This is, again, single subject voxel uh, that have been identified by a separate localizer. There's a little bit of overlap now in the opercularis part of the left inferior frontal gyrus and the PSTS. Uh, we don't know whether this is real overlap or just spatial proximity. It doesn't look like the same exact areas but uh, the overlap with the mathematics region is really striking and makes sense because we are postulating that there is numbers and loops involved. Um, we also did the same experiments in MEG, and of course MEG is much better because in fMRI we were treating one sequence of 16 items, three seconds as just one stimulus. With MEG we can see every single of the tones and ask whether there is a violation or not. Um, so the first thing that we see is that the activation to the standard tones in a standard sequence, the one that are predicted, there is more and more activation for the more and more complex sequences. And you can see this ordering here, which is quite systematic. So that's the model part, the model encoding. It's more and more difficult to encode the tones when uh, complexity is high. Vice versa, when there is a violation, this is a decoder for the presence of a violation. We can decode the presence of violations, but we can decode it earlier and faster and better when uh, the sequence is more regular. Um, and you can see again this monotonic effect in the opposite direction as to the standards. And because we have a decoder, we can apply it to uh, the entire sequence. So you can see now these uh, seven different sequences that we're testing in MEG. And uh, you can see the initial response on the top, then the response after uh, it has been habituated, and you get the occasional deviants, which are marked by little marks here. So you see, the, essentially, you see the entire data, the response of the brain to novelty, um, and to the standard sequences. And I hope you can see that there is decreasing response to violations as a function of complexity which is essentially something which is barely detectable or not detectable at all for the most complex sequences. But also that in some of the most interesting sequences, like this one which is pairs plus alternate, the one you heard so many times, beep, beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, okay, uh, repeated twice. Um, well, what's interesting about this sequence is that sometimes you predict that there should be a repetition and sometimes you predict that there should be an alternation. We get violations to each of these, which means that the subject's brain is really following one by one each of these items and making the proper prediction and changing the prediction as it should, uh, depending on whether you are inside the pairs loop or whether you are inside the alternations loop. So you, we see this brain switching very quickly between predictions and getting the proper violations at every possible place here. So what I've told you so far is that uh, when it comes to sequence processing, whether it's visual, spatial sequences or sort of musical, barely musical sequences, we uh, can get a good description with the language of thought. But I want to go back to Lascaux 
or to some of these uh, geometrical designs and ask, can we also explain uh, the human propensity for geometrical shapes with the same sort of logic? Uh, so can we explain why we love squares and rectangles more than random quadrilaterals? So this has been the beautiful work of Matthias Sablemeyer, who is somewhere here in this room, and will be able to answer all of your questions, hopefully. Um, and, um, I want to show you uh, published as well as unpublished data on this work. So the logic is very simple. Suppose I show you one display like this and you have to detect the outlier shape. Can you see it? I hope you can. Otherwise, you're not human, by the way. Can you detect it here? And can you detect it here? It's actually the same location for the deviant and the same difficulty, I would argue, from the visual point of view because we always start with a shape and we displace the bottom right corner by the same amount. Um, and the, the length of the bottom side here is the same in all of these shapes and we try to match every other property, but we have 11 different shapes that vary in their uh, geometrical regularities. Squares and rectangles have a lot of regularities. They have right angles, parallel sides, equal, equal lengths. Uh, and as we move across this list, we have fewer and fewer regularities. So we did exactly this task of spotting the oddball uh, and uh, many other tasks, and we systematically found that humans are submitted to a huge geometrical regularity effect. Once again, uh, you can detect the deviance very, very well, so this is the percent of error, so you see it's very low, when you see a shape among squares or a square among random shapes. Um, and as these shapes get more and more complex, uh, it gets really much more difficult. We're talking about a large effect here, about 40% errors here. You can be better than chance, but you make a lot of errors. Um, you can see all of these replications of these effects, uh, which make us think that this is really a sort of human universal. Several aspects are interesting here. One is that we can present uh, the data in a sequence format. So we have an experiment where we just present the corners of the shape sequentially, took, 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 a bit like before. And the same exact regularity effect occurs, which means that it's not really something that has to do with grasping the shape all at once. It's really having to do with structuring it in your mind uh, according to the principles of geometry. And you might think that this is dependent on having gone to school. So we tested that by testing, first of all, preschoolers, but even more important, testing the Himba uh, from Namibia, uh, who have very little access to education. Of course, they have their own culture. Uh, it's not so much a culture of geometry uh, like ours. Um, so this is the best we could test for the absence of education. We are still trying to test the infants with this task. But you can see that the geometrical regularity is there in preschoolers and also in the Himba. The data is a little bit noisier. Look looks noisy, I'll come back to that in a second, but really everybody has a geometrical regularity effect. The question of course is would non-human primates have it as well? After all it's just a square, surely they can see a square, right? So we are very lucky to collaborate with Joël Fago in the south of France. Uh, Joël has an amazing facility where you have these baboons uh, roaming around collectively and uh, they can enter these booths and these booths contain video games. Um, the video games are, of course, our tasks. They can enter at any time, 24 hours. Some of them sneak in at 2 in the morning to get their share of the, uh, their, their play of the video games. It's really a sort of addiction, I think. Um, but um, this is a really great setup because you can get 500 to 1,000 trials per day of data per animal. In, in 20 or 30 animals, so it's a huge uh, advantage. And we are able to train the baboons to, uh, first of all, pick up the oddball. So, it's easy to see the oddball here. Then we had them do so for uh, 10 different pairs of sample and oddball in whichever order. So you can see that they really understood the concept of picking the oddball. And then we show that they could generalize to the shapes at the bottom. So they, they really had understood the task. And then we moved them to the geometry task. And uh, remember, this is the data from humans, not just Einstein, but actually any of us. Um, and this is the baboons. There is absolutely no geometrical regularity effect whatsoever. There is no effect at the beginning, and actually they make a lot of errors. So you see they are above chance, but not by much. But then they train and they train and they train with this oddball task, and still they are not better with the rectangle and the square than they are with many of these other shapes. And the, the data is not organized according to the same principle of geometrical regularity. So they behave very differently from us. And this intuition that everybody should see the square is really a human intuition that doesn't seem to be shared by the baboons. Um, the baboons don't do randomly. 
And that's important. So if we correlate, this is all of the baboons for whom we have a lot of data. And you can see there is a very nice square of correlation, here, suggesting that they all have the same sort of behavior, but it's different from all of the behavior of the humans here. And what we were able to show is that there seem to be two different uh, strategies uh, here. We could model the baboon data by a convolutional neural network. In fact, you can take several networks. You take AlexNet, uh, many of these CNNs, uh, all of the CNNs we've tested, if I remember correctly. And basically, you ask, you know, which vector is the most different for these six shapes. And you get a very good predictor for what the baboons do. This is in purple here. But you don't get a good predictor at all for what the humans do. And vice versa, in order to account for the humans do, you can just list the symbolic properties, how many right angles, uh, how many parallel sides, how many equal sides are present in the shape. And you list this and you ask, you know, which is, which is the most different in this space, and then you get a very good predictor for the humans do. And that's where we have interesting data from the Himba and the children. They are not random, but they just have a mixture of these two strategies. Obviously, we have a CNN inside our brain. We can use it for this task, and maybe the Himba and, and the children start using this. But uh, also, right from the start, they have a significant contribution of the predictor from the symbolic model. So we apply to this task an additional layering of symbols. Um, it's an interesting... Um, one interesting aspect of uh, the data that Matthias collected is this is a very strong critique of uh, convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks, according to our data, are not even able to understand what a square is. Right? It's crazy. This should be extremely simple. But it's not simple, and we really tried hard. I'm not claiming that's impossible, but I would love to see this as a challenge to the CCN community. Find a neural network that actually understands what a square is and makes a sharp distinction with other quadrilaterals that can be similar but are not squares. We could not find a neural network that actually would fit this data from the humans uh, at the moment. And uh, this fits very well, again, with my intuition and my impression of testing these uh, networks that they really don't understand geometry. So this is, can you recognize what this is? I, I bet you immediately recognized that these are eggs in a fridge. According to one AI system, these are ping pong balls with a confidence level which is really baffling here. Why? Because ping pong, this is the right texture for ping pong balls, but the shape is wrong, right? And we all, we all know that there's a problem with shape in these neural networks. Um, here's another example from another work, from the work of Théo Desbordes in the lab with Jean-Rémy King. Uh, you ask Dali, imagine a green triangle to the left of a blue circle, and you get things like this. You get nothing like the proper geometrical organization. Again, this may be evolving. Each time I speak about AI, the next week it's false, so maybe this is changing. But I think we really have a problem with addressing these geometrical regularities. Um, so, what is involved at the brain level? Once again, we did fMRI and MEG. Um, it's actually quite surprising. I, I think this is the first study of geometrical shapes in the middle of all of these classical stimuli, like faces and words and tools and houses and so on. We inserted geometrical shapes, like hexagons or triangles or, or squares. And um, we can ask for a contrast, like where are the geometrical shapes more active than other uh, matched stimuli? And we did that in both adults and in six-year-old children and found uh, this picture. There is really a very large... Um, lesser activation of the ventral visual pathway, which you can see in blue here, bilaterally, these geometrical shapes are not good at activating the ventral visual pathway, and so we get this uh, decreasing activation for the green uh, stimuli, which are the geometrical shapes here. On the opposite, we get strong activation once again of the intraparietal sulcus, where we find mass-related activation. This is true in adults, a little bit bilaterally here, but especially on the right, and you can see it in uh, six-year-old children as well. Um, it's in, we, because we were surprised not to find a ventral region that would specialize for these shapes, we searched a little bit hard, and we had several possible hypotheses. They were all rejected. First of all, you could have thought that shapes would be a little bit like letters. Uh, they are learned uh, symbols that convey meaning, maybe not a linguistic meaning. So we looked at the visual word form area in subject-specific voxels, and you see there's very, very little if. Uh, and there is no specific activation to the geometrical shapes here. Uh, likewise, in the FFA, you could have thought maybe these are graded values of quadrilaterals. They would activate the FFA, not at all. Um, what about tools? Tools have some geometrical properties, but there was no activation 
to geometrical shapes in areas that respond to tools. And finally, in areas that care about space uh, and uh, houses, external spaces, and so on, we could not find, uh, even though you could have thought that perhaps they have to do with geometry, but it's not the same sort of geometry. So the ventral pathway in general does not seem to be very strongly concerned here. On the other hand, uh, as you could see, we have dorsal activation in intraparietal sulcus, and using RSA, uh, Matthias was able to show that uh, these support the uh, existence of a distinct symbolic geometric code. Actually, he did that in both behavior and uh, fMRI. In behavior, we obtained the full matrix of human similarity ratings from several hundred subjects online uh, for 11 shapes that we've used repeatedly, and you see this similarity matrix here, and, and Matthias was able to show that you can model it by a sum of the matrices for symbolic geometrical features and for the CNN encoding, but the weights for the symbolic features are much larger than the weights for the uh, non-symbolic uh, vector encodings in CNN. So a, now there is a significant contribution here, and so it, this is more sensitive than before. We really can use both systems, but we tend to rely on the symbolic geometry part. And then uh, Matthias was able to do that uh, in fMRI, uh, again, searchlight RSA, and you can see that the activation is dominated by RSA based on geometric features, which is in orange here. And there is a little bit of uh, occipital, uh, lateral occipital, uh, bilateral activation related, whose matrix is related to CNN encoding. So basically, yes, we have CNNs, they contribute to our encoding of shapes, but we go way beyond that because we are humans, we use our dorsal mathematics system and we encode them in a more discrete uh, manner. Um, Matthias was also able to record MEG signals in Neurospin, and uh, in this case, uh, I like the MEG experiment because it's just passive, you're just looking at these shapes, you get bombarded by shapes, and uh, there is an occasional deviant, once again, to keep you uh, interested and active. And so this is the response to the deviants. You see very, very clearly a purely uh, linear organization, uh, or almost purely linear organization, of the response to the deviants as a function of uh, the complexity. So you get a strong response to the square and rectangle deviants, and smaller and smaller responses to uh, the uh, less regular deviants. Um, I think I'm not saying this right, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. There were mini blocks where each of these shapes were being presented repeatedly, and each of them had their own deviance as before. And what you're seeing here is the response to the deviance in the middle of mini blocks that were organized by these different shapes. So having a shape as a constant helps you to discover the, uh, the deviance. Um, and uh, I think this is the, the most interesting, is the parsing across time. Uh, you can see here RSA analysis of MEG signals um, and uh, the corresponding source analysis. And uh, we can see that the initial part of the MEG response is well captured by a convolutional neural network. So the similarity for the beginning of the response is uh, well captured by the neural network and only later around 200, 300 milliseconds, a bit later, uh, do we see a dominance of the symbolic code. So that makes sense. Um, the fact that it starts so early is a bit shocking, but remember that these are mini blocks. So you see the same shape several times, so it's possible for the subjects to anticipate what's going on. So this may be the explanation. But you can see also the sources are quite consistent, although always take with a grain of salt the sources from MEG, but you can see they are consistent with bilateral occipitoparietal activation for the convolutional neural network and with a much more bilateral dorsal going all the way into the prefrontal cortex uh, network for symbolic uh, processing. So uh, this is where we are so far. We are trying to go a little bit beyond that and we just published a paper together with Josh Tenenbaum uh, and uh, Kevin Ellis to show that you can actually design a computer language to account for the so many shapes that are present in cultures throughout the world. For instance, a spiral. It's not a quadrilateral, right? It's beyond quadrilaterals. But what can we account for the spiral? Well, we found that we can design a mini language that has a minimal number of functions for number, for geometry, and especially control circuits for repeat, concatenate, and sub-programs, a recursive call, and with this minimal set of instructions, we could account for essentially all of the geometrical shapes that recur in cultures throughout the world. And uh, the basic hypothesis is that when we see such a shape, we do program inference. 
we search through the space of possible programs for the minimal program that will uh, generate the appropriate shape. So we're still uh, continuing this research program, trying to test whether this language is really sufficient, which shape escape it, what more is needed, and can we also account for other uh, capacities. But I want to reach my uh, conclusions now, uh, and I will uh, make it in the form of uh, three different proposals. So the first proposal, I think, is the summary of what I've said. Uh, I uh, would like to claim that there's something very particular in humans, uh, of course, this is a hypothesis. It'd be nice if it is violated, but at the moment, it looks like whenever we test non-human animals, we don't find the same sort of capacity for symbolic thought. It looks like this is not the feat of one circuit, like Broca's area. It's the feat of distributed circuits throughout the brain. Maybe all of the human brain has this capacity for recursive combinatorial thought. The key properties are discretization of the concepts, assignment of symbols that compose recursively and the capacity for very fast inference in the space of the possible expressions that are given by these languages. And uh, there are several interesting consequences. First, I, I think if we really think that this is a human universal, we may begin to account for cross-cultural convergence. I'm showing you here an example, which is lovely. This is the Pascal triangle. It's, it says it's before Pascal. It's uh, in uh, Chinese culture. We love the same mathematical concepts, not just squares, but Pascal triangles all over the world. We have the same mathematics. There is no cultural variation in mathematics, or very, very little, because we have the same sort of structures that we can produce, the same sort which are minimal. But beyond the minimal, the space of possible concepts is exponentially large, and so this is the flip side of the coin. We have an extraordinary capacity to generate infinitely many concepts we have an extraordinary expansion of our representational abilities, and we can even represent things that do not exist. Uh, for, this is quite typical of so many cultures. They have chimeras. The original chimera is a lion and a deer together, two heads. This is the seven-headed seven snake from antiquity. I've given you the expression, that's it. You have the concept, the seven-headed snake. It's a very compact expression, and yet you can think something completely novel that does not exist, right? This is how cultures diverge, because they can think of so many different possibilities. Out of this grammar, it's exponential. And so you end up thinking things like this. This is out of a Trump uh, demonstration. Uh, imaginary numbers. The square root of minus one, it's a very interesting uh, expression. It's a crazy expression to start with, imaginary, right? But yet, it's a functional expression. We can think of it, we can work with it, we can manipulate it, and we get great mathematics, so we keep it because it's useful in mathematics. But I think it's typical of this generative capacity. And we, of course, we can generate many more symbols and many more crazy ideas. I will not go into any of these details here, but uh, you, I think you are with me. Um, and uh, it means that there is a very important cultural evolution, and especially linguistic constraint to convey to our children which concepts we think are important, because the explosion is so vast. So we can conceive of com language as a communication device, as a way to constrain our attention and our learning, to focus it to the subspaces of this giant tree of possibilities in order to learn the concepts that a given culture finds important. My last slide, uh, I hope I have convinced you that we have a little problem in neuroscience. There is something human-specific that we need to study. Um, human behavior remains, in some respects, very poorly captured by current artificial neural networks, Key ingredients are missing, if I'm correct. And uh, I, I do not mean that there will not be a neural network that captures it. I think there will be. And uh, Yoshua Benjo, for instance, making strong efforts to have symbolic neural networks. Um, I believe that psychology is a first approximation of the dynamics of neural networks. So we will find neural networks, but we have to make a special effort to find these neural codes that may be specific to humans. And uh, so uh, I am trying to actively collaborate with people who have access to the neural data in human subjects. We really need neural population responses during the processing of some of these symbolic languages in order to see this putatively particular code of the human brain. Uh, with that, I will close. I'm showing you some of the faces of the people who did this work over the years. Uh, and especially, I would like to single out Matthias Sablé-Meyer, who is here, and uh, Li Ping Wang, who did this wonderful monkey work. And, and thank you very much for your attention.
Jay. Hey, Stan. Hey. Uh, brilliant work, as always. And uh, I'm deeply inspired by all of it. Um, but my question is to understand more about individual differences in mathematical ability and experience effects and how you think about that. So, you know, so many people talk about the Van Healy's, for example, how, you know, it takes many years of thinking about abstract mathematics to start being able to actually get how to prove a theorem or something like that. And I just, yeah. how do you think about that in relation to these beautiful findings that you yeah. have? Thank you, that's a great question. Obviously the tree of mathematics is enormous and takes years to grow. I'm really interested in the very fundamental abilities. That's why I'm so interested in infants. And I collaborate a lot with Elizabeth Spelker and with my wife. We really try to look at what is available in infants. For instance, there is nice work uh, by Lisa Feigenson suggested that infants understand not only number, which we know for many years, and that's common to other animals, but they seem to understand sets of sets. They understand two sets of two, which has not been tested in animals as far as I know. And, and so this is very, very early on. So I would like to argue that these abilities really characterize the hardware of the human brain. They are present extremely early on. It's very important that we test more infants to prove that. And, but um, I would like to argue that even before school, for instance, the existence of symbolic drawings by children, when a two-year-old starts to make a circle to draw a ball or to draw a face, this is an incredible power of abstraction that, again, we should study more, but suggests that there is really proto-mathematics. So this is the sort of mathematics I'm interested in, the fact that it starts extremely early, and in this respect, it starts essentially in every culture in the world. The geometry of paintings, body paintings, is essentially a human universal. Okay, thanks. Hello, thank you for sharing all these exciting findings, and I would like to ask, what do you think the language of thought can be affected by a lack of language? Let's say if there is an individual who is unfortunate that hasn't a pick up language ability, um, would their um, language of thought be less complex or less enriched than um, people who uh, are no normally developed? A very nice question, yeah. So there are, there are two, two different answers. If you are an adult and if you have a lesion to the language network, uh, your mathematics may well be fine. And there is a little bit of data suggesting that you can still do algebra, for instance, even if you are dramatically aphasic. Uh, likewise for music, and we see this dissociation at the brain level in fMRI. Now, your question is more about development, and there I don't think we know so well. Uh, it, uh, the idea is that this is a non-linguistic network, and you would think of shapes even if you were not told about shape. But I also pointed to the role of language, natural language as a pointer to say this is an important concept, please learn it. So surely language conveys some of these concepts or at least draws attention to these nonverbal representations. And the two become very tightly intermingled in development and that makes it a little bit hard to study. There are of course occasional reports of uh, people with uh, high level autism uh, being able to have one but less of the other. Uh, so high mathematics, but less of the communication language. But the dissociation is not so sharp and not so easy to study. So, so that's, that's a difficult question to disentangle. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful talk. I have a couple of general questions. So I'm very interested in hearing what your definition of symbol is, because it's confusing to me that like in animals, we have all these abstract representations, like place cells, grid cells, that you can bind a symbol to. And you're saying that like, and they're like geometrical too. So I'm very surprised that you're not finding any evidence for you know, regularities or like symbolic representations in primates. Yeah. And I wonder if it's because of the lack of a uh, symbol or it's because of the symbol that we are using is very different from animal symbol and that we're not communicating the symbol to them. The, there is a real definition problem. So uh, uh, I, first of all, I would like to distinguish between a symbol and a representation. There's a lot of evidence, as, exactly as you said, for mental representation in ants, in mice. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I would like to claim that we should reserve the word symbol for a much more narrower sense. And that's controversial. Maybe we, maybe we should find a completely different term. Um, there is also a very nice paper by uh, Andreas Nieder uh, following up on Peirce and on Deacon, uh, introducing distinction between indexes and symbols. Animals have learned indexes when they've learned a, a lexigram for a particular object. But by symbol, we want to reserve that term for a system. 
where there are multiple indexes and there are operations at the level of the symbols that correspond to operations in the outside world. So for instance, for Arabic numerals, uh, you can manipulate purely the symbols and say two times three and you get six and you can predict that if you get two rows of three objects, you'll get six objects in the outside world. So the internal computations, the internal manipulations are a key feature of symbols. If you just have isolated tokens, th these are indexes, but these are not symbols. So that's the sort of vocabulary that I, I think we should use in order to keep our thinking straight. So just to clarify, you mean that if they can be, uh, we, if, we think, if we can do algebra on the symbols, then you would call them symbols? And if animals can do algebra? You need something like an algebra yeah, or a language. I call it a language, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, with internal operations that have a correspondence to the outside world. Well, sounds good. That would be the definition. We'll have our final question from Tyler. Oh, thanks. Um, wonderful talk. Uh, appreciate the line of reasoning around the geometric inferences. And I loved the uh, color map on the MEG data. It was, it was beautiful. <laughs> um, I'm still unconvinced about the cross-species comparison. As many of us know who try to compare, for example, humans and computational models, ensuring that both systems are trying to solve the same problem is actually really challenging. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of things that you've done to ensure that the humans, for example, and the monkeys are trying to solve the same task. Um, and I was curious if you could talk us through some of what those steps might be. Mm. For example, uh, you might imagine that uh, if monkeys are trying simply to maximize use reward and there's a challenging trial, uh, they're just gonna choose randomly, skip onto the next trial as fast as possible so that they can maximize use reward and minimize cognitive effort. Um, I'm sure you've thought through these things for those of us who are interested in formal model comparison between humans and computational systems, it's often useful to hear how you might compare humans to other animals because a lot of these same challenges are present. Yeah, no, it's, a gr it's a wonderful question and I, I wish I had a thorough answer to all of that. There is something completely unfair in doing fMRI of uh, human uh, students versus uh, poor monkeys that have had no education and uh, you know, are stuck in the lab. Uh, we, uh, as you said, we try to compensate for that by giving them more training. So in the F you, uh, monkey fMRI experiment, there was a lot more training in the monkeys. That didn't change anything. Uh, there is the notion of reward, but you're right. This could be biasing them in the wrong direction. I think it's, it's very well controlled in Yiping Wang's experiments, where the monkeys are super motivated to get the full sequence right. And if they could compress these four items by saying, you know, it's two by two or something like that, then they would do it. And in fact, um, we should stay tuned because Leaping is continuing this work, of course. This was, two, this was two photon imaging. And first of all, he's getting electrophysiology data, which is going, going to be incredible because you can track each of the individual items much more finely through time. But he's also showing that monkeys do grasp eventually some of these regularities. So for instance, they do, and they do compress the one, two, three, four sequence eventually. Um, I think the point still is that they don't do so spontaneously and we do. Thank you. Thanks, Stan, again. Thank you so much. Thank you.